Evening. My name is Rod McMillian. I'm a vice chair of the Board of Education. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, March 8, 2022. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Mr. Christian Thomas. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and virtually and broadcast online through Microsoft Teams and through BCPS TV, Comcast, Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon, Fios Channel 30, 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is consideration of the March 8th agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? There are none. Hearing none, the agenda stands. Excuse me. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Thomas. Um, I, I move to add legislative committee updates to item S uh, with board member comments and agenda setting. Second. Mr. Thomas, will you repeat that? Yes, I move to add legislative committee updates to item S of the agenda. I move to add committee updates. Legislative committee updates. Excuse me? Legislative committee updates. Updates to letter. Yeah, I can type it in the chat, yeah. Now, if I can find this to read it. Mr. Thomas moves to add legislative committee updates to item S of the agenda. So I have a, do I have a second? Second. Mrs. Second. Causey. Yes, second, Ms. Okay. Causey. Okay. Is there any discussion? Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I'll just speak to the motion. Um, I, at, at the last legislative committee meeting, we did take some action in, in removing some bills forward to the full board for consideration. So I, I, I know that we could have just discussed this. I, I, don't, I don't think we have committee updates um, on, on here this evening. So I just wanted to make sure we had designated time to review those and discuss those. Thank you. Any additional discussion? Ms. Gover, can I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. This revised agenda is approved, and the agenda stands as approved. Minutes of closed session. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. Two, number one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matters that affect one or more specific individuals. The minutes of the closed session and information sum summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. Next on the agenda is a special order of business recognizing Ms. Kimberly Culberson. At this time, could Ms. Culberson please join Dr. Williams and I at the front of the dais.
Okay. Fellow board members, I move that the board accept the following resolution, 2022-05, in recognition of Ms. Culberson, Ms. Kimberly Culberson, as follows. Resolution 2022-05, whereas Ms. Kimberly Culberson has served the students of Baltimore County Public Schools with honor and distinction since 2006, and whereas Ms. Culberson's integrity, compassion, and tireless efforts to promote academic success inspire and enrich the students, teachers, administrators, and staff of Baltimore County Public Schools, and whereas in honor of Ms. Culberson's achievements, leadership, and expertise, she was named the Assistant Principal of the Year by the Maryland Association of Secondary Principals, and whereas Ms. Culberson's commitment to education, attention to detail, and service to the Towson High School community has consistently resulted in academic and social advancements, and whereas as in recognition of Ms. Culberson's work ethic, collaborative nature, and innovative approach to supporting students and reaching their fullest potential, and dedication to building leadership capacity, therefore be it resolved that the Board of Education herewith assembled in the regular session on the 8th day of March and the year 2022 expresses to Ms. Kimberly Culberson on behalf of the citizens of this county our deepest appreciation and gratitude for her service, and be it further resolved that the Board herewith extends its best wishes for her good health, happiness, and continued success. May I have a second? Second, Thomas. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. The board is unanimous. Congratulations, Ms. Culver. At this time, we're going to take some photos. Yes. At this time, I invite Ms. Culberson to please bring. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams, Vice Board Chair, Mr. McMillian, and the entire BCPS Board for taking the time to recognize me with this honor tonight. Receiving this honor has been one of the highlights of my 16-year career in Baltimore County Public Schools, and I've been extremely grateful and humbled to represent the determined students, dedicated educators, and supportive community of not just BCPS, but the entire state of Maryland. In reflecting upon this honor, I recall the quote from Sir Isaac Newton. If I have seen further than others, it is by standing on the shoulder of giants. This quote reminds me that I am where I am today because of others that have lifted me up. From my grandfather who came to this country with little education, a few dollars in his pocket, and a dream to build a home, life, and family in Baltimore, to all of my colleagues, mentors, leaders, and friends in BCPS, that have supported and guided me along the way, and to all the students that have and continue to inspire me, teach me, and fuel my passion. These are the true giants, the true heroes of my story, and the true reason why I sit before you today. These giants have instilled in me the values of service, equity, justice, kindness, and gratitude, and they serve as my motivation each day to be the, to be the best educator and human that I can be. Although I have held many positions in Baltimore County Public Schools, being an assistant principal is one of the most rewarding as I have the opportunity every day to lift others up, students, teachers, leaders, and community members alike, so that each individual can see further, go further, and ultimately reach their fullest potential. Together, as Team BCBS, let's continue to lift everyone up to raise the bar, close the gaps, and prepare each and every student for their gigantically bright future. Thank you again for this tremendous opportunity to be with you all tonight and to represent and give thanks to all the giants in BCBS and in Maryland. Thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Culberson. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for this, I call on Ms. Anderson. Good evening, Vice Chairman McMillian, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters. Retirements, resignations, leaves, recognition of service, certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits E-1 through E-5? So, so moved. So moved, Mac. Second, Thomas. Mr. Thomas, second. Any discussion? Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Thank you. Thank Motion you. Motion carries. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that, I call on Dr. Williams. Good evening, Vice Chair McMillian and members of the board. I am bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. Specialist of Compliance in the Office of Title I and Enterprise Systems Engineer Backup System, the Office of Network Support Services. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit F1? So moved. Thomas? Second. Ms. Causey? Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, Ms. Gover? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Dr. Williams? So our first up. Our first appointee is Emily G. Critch, a teacher of resource at currently at Patapsco High School. Appointment to specialist of compliance in the office of Title I. She's bringing 16 years of experience in Baltimore County. She served as the resource teacher at Patapsco, academic engagement teacher at Hollibert Middle School, and a vocal music teacher at General, General John Stricker Middle School, Patapsco High School, and White Oak. Congratulations, Emily G. Critch. <laughs> Next, we have Peter T. Linthicum, Enterprise System Engineer, Backup System, Office of Network System Services. This is a new position. Prior to this appointment, he has served as the IT Director of Business Development of uh, Dance of York for seven years, Senior Solutions Architect, Senior Systems Engineer, S Solutions Advisory Systems Engineer, Senior Systems Consultant, and Enterprise Systems Manager and Network Administrator. So congratulations, Peter T. Linthicum. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your con concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of this meeting by allowing those who registered to speak to attend in person. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regular scheduled board meeting. Speakers are selected randomly using electronic selection process for all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrants are received, all who register will be permitted to speak. However, no speaker substitutions will be allowed. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper form to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone at an inappropriate 
at inappropriate personnel marks or other behavior disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask speakers to observe the three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if, this, if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting or, on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. I now call on our advisory and stakeholder group leaders to speak. Ms. Sheila Reed with the Baltimore County Alliance for Black Educators. Greetings, Board Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, and Dr. Williams, and other board members. My name is Shelia Reed, and I come before you as a proud member of the Baltimore County Alliance of Black School Educators, fondly known as BCAPSI. We have been tasked as a chapter affiliate of the National Alliance of Black School Educators to bring attention to school communities serving black learners. BCAPSI offers a network of communities, of communication for educators, current and retired, which I am, particularly educators of color in Baltimore County to enhance the skills and capabilities for improving the quality of education for all children and students. We hope, we, we sadly have seen that learners, black and white, have become the unintended, I hope, victims of unapologetic activism to reverse diversity initiatives and the offering of truthful, truthful historic and literary content. This is a dangerous movement which will lessen the potential of our students to compete in the world. So, BCAPSI will be laser focused on two priorities. Those two priorities are advocacy and persistence. We have witnessed a decline in engagement for learners in homeschooling, e-learning, and VLP, especially learners who receive special education services. We are advocating for more resources for special education services to these programs. BCAPSI appreciates the addition of services and supports in the new budget and will be advocating for fiscal support from the County Council. It is a long time coming to talk about just closing the gap. We must work and partner with Dr. Williams to do it. Count on us for more patience and persistence and being more active. Thank you, and have a good evening. Thank you, Ms. Reed. Mr. John Clark with the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Local 434. Excuse me. Good evening, Dr. Williams and uh, members of the board. Again, my name is John Clark. At the uh, Board of Education School Board meeting held on uh, February 22nd, 2022, Board member Lily Rowe made a motion 
and I quote, I move that the Board of Education require that the final county approved transportation allocation be utilized in whole or in part to begin a process to outsource all student transportation operations and services to a vendor who will take over our entire student transportation operation, provided the vendor will also absorb and comply with the negotiated BCPS bargaining units, absorb all employees at current pay and benefits or better, and take into account the absorption of all student transportation related assets and uh, excluding real estate as part of the, uh, the agreement, unquote. This motion was seconded for discussion and supported by board member Kathleen Causey. Board member Rowe further stated that it was her intention to abolish the entire transportation department. Now this motion, without a doubt, demonstrates board members Rowe and Causey's lack of understanding of school bus transportation and the operations of BCPS on a daily basis. School bus drivers, bus attendants, and fleet staff represented by ASME take great pride in their work. While ASME recognizes room, room for improvement, board member Rose's suggestion, suggestion that operations are outsourced is unrealistic and disrespectful to our work. Outsourcing will not result in more drivers behind the wheel or attendance on buses. Outsourcing will not improve the, the behavior on the, uh, on the buses. And sadly, board member Rowe also quoted statistics from Fox News rather than facts available from NDOT, MVA, or the uh, BCPS Office of Transportation, Transportation regarding the safety of our school buses. As an ASME employee, I am concerned that board members Rowe and Causey took this position to try and abolish the Transportation Department as they have publicly disrespected our hard work. And just in case you didn't know, the issues of employee shortages and unruly students are not exclusive to the Baltimore County public school system. These same issues are plaguing school systems all across this entire nation, and your, flak, your factless motion will do nothing to solve our transportation issues and has greatly agitated the hardworking membership of ASME. And to the remaining members of the board, we thank you for, me, for being able to see through the smoke and not allowing this motion to move forward. It is ASME's hope that this motion or any other motion that even remotely comes close to this one is never ever brought to the table again. Let's sit down at the table and have a conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Mr. Bosch Ferrone, Central Educational, Central, excuse me, Central Area Educational Advisory Council. Good evening to all. The active, er the active members of the central area organized presentation last Wednesday. And it is in relation, as I told you before, about stress, anxiety in school, adolescents, and children. We had about 30 plus people attend. Many of them were outside the BCPS uh, employee universe and I was very happy with that. Students are really stressed about grades, about homework, about sleep deprivation, peer pressure, et cetera. And they have fear, and I think shame, of reaching out to the counselors, which really a point is made by our very good student member uh, in his observation. We were blessed to have the county executive come in and give um, his vision and blessing um, for five, seven, eight minutes. The speaker was Dr. Todd Peters. He was really excellent, informative, engaging. His presentation was 30 minutes, but the question and answer period was more than 30 minutes. And honestly, by 8.15, if I kept the meeting going, people would have stayed and spent time with Dr. Peters. As you know, anxiety would lead to many wrong things. So this would be my brief report about the central area. I want to mention to you that I made um, communication again with Ms. Phelps 
I personally strongly believe that myself and my team members, the active members of my team, would be really good to support the foundation. I think, I think the county should really support the foundation far more than what they do. So the foundation can support the teachers, the students, the school system. Um, as you know, all hospitals have similar systems and people donate right and left to have more buildings and more equipment in hospitals. And I, I just don't, don't get it why our county businesses and individuals don't really contribute more to the foundation so the foundation can uh, contribute to the school system. Personally, I strongly believe in that. Dr. Ferron, thank you. Ms. Marlena Purcell from the Southwest Area Educational Advisory Council. Ms. Purcell? Dr. Bosch is going to look for her. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Next is a general public comment, and our first speaker is Ms. Sharon Seroff. Our s we must be way ahead of schedule. Uh, That's a joke. <laughs> nope. Thank you, Mr. Ralph. Miss Malaya Anderson. Ms. Anderson, I hope I pronounced your first name right. Sorry. <laughs> it's Malia. <laughs> Good evening, members of the board and Superintendent Dr. Williams. I come before you as a concerned member of the Transportation Department. As an active union member, I've watched many board meetings throughout my 12 years with Baltimore County, and I've never felt the need to come here and speak but after the negative comments about the Transportation Department during last uh, board meeting, I had to. Many of us, myself included, are offended that certain board members feel that our department is so inefficient that we should be replaced with contractors. Thankfully, the motion was rejected. However, it was still offensive. Drivers, attendants, routing assistants, field reps, dispatchers, mechanics, customer service reps, driver trainers, and management work extremely hard every single day on worse than a skeleton crew to get these kids to school safely. The reason we're struggling has nothing to do with us being ineffective. It has everything to do with not having enough drivers and attendants. That's our bottom line. And we can't get or retain drivers here because the uh, because of the inadequate pay and the student behavior on these buses. Every single day, many of us have to deal with being cursed out by kids, cursed out and or threatened by parents, even to the extent of wanting to do physical harm to us just because a bus is running late. Ridiculous. When issues are reported to school administration over and over and over again and nothing is done, we have to continue to deal with the problem. How do you think that affects our morale or what little there is left of it? Our union president, Brian Epps, has coordinated visits to all transportation bus lots, along with our um, director, Dr. Grimm. Superintendent Williams, Vice Chair McMillian, and student board member Christian Thomas have been to our bus lots to hear concerns from us. Where's the rest of the board? 
We need the full board support to help us address the real issues that we're facing in this department, which is no accountability for poor student behavior on these buses and lousy salary, which has resulted in losing far too many drivers and being unable to hire more, which is a national crisis and not just a BCPS crisis. We should be receiving thank yous for struggling through this tough time right now instead of insults. The solution isn't to outsource our department, but to work with our union leadership at the bargaining table to address the issues that we have. Thank you. Ms. Anderson, thank you. Ms. Stephanie Foy. Members of the Board of Education, Dr. Williams and superintendent staff, as well as other stakeholders who are present. My name is Stephanie Foy, and I was a BCPS elementary school teacher for 31 years. I retired in 2014. I find it disheartening that no attention was given to the matter of incorrect benefit deductions from retirees' pensions which occurred as a result of the ransomware attack in November of 2020. It is sad to realize the lack of respect given to those of us who dedicated our careers to the students of Baltimore County. Nothing was done about this problem until a story on Fox News hit the airwaves on February 16th. Since then, there have been two more stories aired by Fox and one by WJZ. All of a sudden, the problem is going to be fixed. Dr. Williams said he would designate a consultant to address this issue, and it's going to be corrected by May 1st for all 9,000 of us. Colleagues of mine had been calling the Office of Benefits for months prior to this news story only to be told that the ransomware attack in November 2020 had caused the problem and that it had not been corrected. In many cases, callers left messages which were never answered. One friend lost her husband last summer and could not get him removed from her insurance and is still paying for his health insurance as we sit here. As a member of the TABCO Retired Steering Committee, I have been more informed about this situation than the average retiree, some of whom may not even know now that this is the case. The head of the TABCO Retired Steering Committee, Angela Leitzer, was contacted through TABCO President Cindy Sexton and asked to meet with Dr. Yarbrough about the situation following the stories in the news. The first meeting took place on February 18th, and there are to be follow-ups, follow-up meetings weekly. At the meeting on the 18th, the BCPS reps said that the retiree deduction issues, quote, have been elevated to the highest level of priority, unquote. While I genuinely appreciate these words, it is clear that this would not have happened if this had not hit the press. I am going to briefly review some of the items that were listed to be done during that first meeting and whether there has been progress. First of all, I feel badly for uh, Dr. Yarbrough for getting stuck with this since she only came here in December. And I would like uh, everyone to know. I'm sorry, Ms. Foy. I sure wish I could keep going. Excuse me, I didn't hear you. I sure wish I could keep going. I got two. Ms. Foy, thank you. Ms. Amy Adams. Oh. Is it on? Thank you. Mr. Thomas. Um, okay, I would like again to state my agreement with Vice Chair McMillian's previous suggestion to take board meetings to locations throughout the county to promote community engagement. Um, I would also 
because of the new guidance that was released today related to the adjustments to BCPS COVID-19 plan, I would like to request that board meetings return open to the public without capacity restrictions, please. The agenda topic I want to focus on tonight is the presentation by Dr. McComas and Mr. McConley about report on the Maryland early fall assessment results. We are now halfway through the school year and have two quarters worth of grades and some standard test scores for, for our students post-pandemic. A February 25th Baltimore Sun article titled Maryland Data on Student Achievement Shows Dramatic Declines in Learning Across the Region During Pandemic reports that Baltimore County students fared somewhat better than the city. We have seen the reports about the city schools. To fare somewhat better is very concerning. The state data shows 18% of county elementary students in grades three through five scored proficient in math, 25% in English, and 40% in science. So more than half of our kids are not proficient. In grades six through eight, 17% of students were proficient in math, 37% in English, and 34 in science. Again, way less than 50% proficient. High schoolers fared a little bit better on the assessments with 60% of 10th graders scoring proficient in English and 45% in science. About 16% of the county's middle and high school students who completed algebra and geometry courses scored proficient in the assessments. It's part of our tagline is closing the gaps. How is BCPS working to make this happen? We are hearing concerns from parents every day, especially parents of grades one through four whose kids have missed their foundation and are being accelerated right past them. So I hope to learn tonight in the academic pres presentation more about how the curriculum and the staff is gonna respond to the data that is presented. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Marlena Purcell is now present. She's from the Southwest Area Educational Advisory Council. Ms. Purcell. Good evening, thank you. I don't chair, but <laughs> good evening. I was just gonna greet everyone, but I realized, forget it. <laughs> thank you again, everyone. I am Marlena Colleton Purcell for the record, Southwest Area Education Advisory Chair. And I just wanted to bring a report of our quarterly meetings and to also inform the Southwest Area um, of what they can do in the future. January meeting was a joint meeting with Northwest and Central Area, where we provided space for Ms. Sue Hahn, program specialist in the Office of Family and Community Engagement. We had over 40 in attendance and many were able to capture strategies to try in their local schools. In February, we turned up the heat a little and invited Ms. Stansbury and Dr. Winstead to the joint meeting with Northwest Area to describe the who and the what of community schools. It was at that meeting, many walked away, even on Valentine's Day, walked away with a wealth of understanding and were able to put to bed a lot of myths that they may have had. I'm here today to be assure everyone and to make everyone aware that we do have meetings on the second Mondays of the month and our next uh, meeting will be Monday, March 14th. We will have a panel to discuss in depth the magnitude of how um, excuse me, the magnitude of the blueprint. So I'm inviting each and every one of you at the board and Southwest parents to attend. And um, it is our hope that you walk away with specific strategies such as um, the blueprint of Maryland's future legislation, including the both short-term and long-term timelines, the value of our community and stakeholders input, and the avenues in which we have available to us and how to access and to participate in those avenues. Of course, we know that everyone cannot attend, so we are having this meeting virtually. You may receive the Zoom link when you go onto the BCPS website. You may always email us if you're unable to attend or ask any questions or comments. We are open and in inclusive. The email address is the email, the BC, S-W-A-E-C at gmail.com. And we thank each and every one of you um, for your past support. We welcome any comments as we move forward. Specifically, we're asking Southwest to show up 
Make sure that your voices are heard for the new policies that are in place or going to be in place. Now is the time, not after the policies are being made. Thank you again for your time. Thank you, Ms. Purcell. I noticed Ms. Sharon Serhoff arrived. Ms. Serhoff. Good evening. I am concerned about a trend I am seeing in how the county addresses problems. Problems in transportation, teacher shortage, special education, technology. We aren't doing a good job with transportation. We don't have enough drivers. Our routing software doesn't get our students to and from school in a timely manner or safely. Over the years, I've heard this excuse over and over. Now, instead of solving the problem ourselves, we want to farm it out and makes it someone else's problem. That to me is unacceptable. We are having trouble hiring teachers and retaining teachers. We gave them a bonus hoping they would stay. Wouldn't it be better to listen to their concerns of being overworked and underpaid? Why should a teacher get a wage that is not a living wage? Why should teachers have to stay at school and do schoolwork outside of school hours for free? They have families too. They should be able to spend time with them. They should not have to have second and third jobs to pay for essentials. Virtual learning. We didn't do a good job last year, yet some kids were more successful in the virtual platform than they were in person. That, however, isn't important. Our students with disabilities don't matter unless they are in the general education classroom. If they need additional services, they can't access virtual learning. You claim you can't do it successfully. You claim you are following state recommendations. That's an excuse. It's an excuse for your lack of willingness to improve a program and listen to the requests of the families that you serve. I attended a focus group back in January. And overwhelming members of that focus group said that they wanted virtual learning to be open to everyone. You're not listening. Communication, that's a big deal. We can't even find on our websites now the names of principals, vice principals, and IEP chairs. They're not available. Fix it. Thank you, Ms. Serhoff. Ms. Amy Taylor, excuse me, Ms. Mary Taylor. Sorry, sorry, Mary. Ms. Mary Taylor. Good evening, Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Williams, members of the Board of Education. I'm here to talk about school safety this evening. Safety ought to be the first priority of our schools. The mantra is, if you see something, say something. But in our schools, principals, the SROs, teachers, students, and parents are essentially told, if you see something, don't say or do anything, because if you do, you'll be the one in trouble. Is this because school administrators are being held to statistics over safety? Well, this fear-based drive to decrease disciplining statistics has destabilized our schools and has adults putting their own professional interests in producing lower disciplinary statistics ahead of their sacred charge to keep our children safe in school. 
In policy 5550 and 5560, the Board of Education of Baltimore County is committed to ensuring and maintaining an environment of order, safety, and discipline necessary for effective teaching and learning. The board understands that providing a safe and secure learning environment requires that clear expectations for appropriate behavior be communicated, supported, and interventions be provided, and consequences for inappropriate behavior be communicated and administered equitably. Both these policies use the word may, which gives those who are initiating the use of these apologies a large amount of discretion. So let's change the word to must, because many of these kids are often repeat offenders, often getting in trouble in multiple fights and other illegal activities with no repercussions. They're back at school in a few days or not removed at all, repeating the same issues. This clearly sends a message to these kids that they can continue to act out, be disruptive and violent with no repercussions at school and probably not as home as well. And while I understand discretion may be warranted under certain circumstances, consistent consequences must be implemented for severe offenses. BCPS must stop sending the message Get the numbers down or else. We need to start prioritizing statistics over our student safety. And while I might say, while well, I was in Annapolis today, speaking on behalf of a couple education bills in front of our Senate Education Committee today, I want to thank, well, I want to say, I appreciate getting the memo from BCPS that our schools are going to back to some normalcy, and maybe we can all start healing after two years of COVID. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Nicole Solomon. Hello, my no name is Nicole Solomon. I drive a school bus and I have children in BCPS. I'm here tonight because I have ideas and solutions to the issues with transportation. Other drivers and employees would love to sit down and share some ideas as well. We are in the thick of it, and it gives one a good perspective on how things could be more efficient. Please set up a way for us to do this with you, the board. Many of us will volunteer our time to solve this for the kids, our own time. I want to share with you one money-saving idea that I have. But there are other ideas, some expanded from the shareholder and audit surveys. My idea would also work in other areas of BCPS, especially ones with shortages like cafeteria workers. An inquiry into the exact numbers would be great, and I offer my time and have solutions to any kinks. Picture a two-scale employment. One is what we currently have, full-time with benefits. The other would be full-time paid at a higher rate without any benefits. This other avenue could entice a whole other group of potential employees that want to work for larger pay rate. Start by figuring out the average that BCPS spends on benefits per employee. My rust estimate based on my own benefits is around 10,000 a year. This means for the no benefits employees, you could change starting pay from 16.69 to 23 an hour and break even or save money, start at $20 an hour, beating FedEx and Amazon's starting wage, coming in at a comparable rate to other bus driving jobs. The goal is to have enough drivers and attendants to safely and efficiently get these kids to school. My soul is crushed when I am out sick. I know that my kids might not get to school that day, or they will have a very disruptive day, which doesn't encourage learning. I do not think inquiries into ideas are bad and things that that's what this board is for, ideas, inquiries. With the full idea of fully privatizing transportation, the numbers should be ran, but I can tell you that a good portion of drivers will leave without benefits. Only a very large employer like BCPS can provide. No contractor would come close, leaving us with an even bigger shortage and people worried another Bethlehem Steel situation would happen. I would love this idea looked into, as it helps keep the drivers we have, opens the doors to those that want a larger wage. Some other ideas I have involve a solution to bus behavior. 
the quick turnover rate, hiring ideas, to name a few. Thank you for your time. I hope we can meet again. Ms. Solomon, thank you. Dr. Bosch Ferrone. Good evening again, and I have an idea for you. Every meeting we stand and pledge allegiance to the flag with liberty and justice for all. And of course, Maryland is known to be the land uh, of the free and home of the brave. So the question is, what's the definition of the freedom and liberty and does the school system really teach that to our generation, our young generation, who will be uh, the future leaders and military leaders and economists and everything else? The website doesn't really give me any access to the curriculum. I mean, it's silly. When I type curriculum, I get things that, that doesn't tell me anything. So I have been living in Baltimore County for 48 years. I pay on average of $10,000 every year in county taxes. Multiply it by 48, uh, it's a whole lot of money. If you add interest and dividends, it would be even more. But I have asked Dr. Hirston for access to the curriculum and was turned down. I asked Dr. Dance for access and turned down. I asked Ms. Verlita White when she was uh, superintendent interim, and I was turned down. And I really don't get it. So why do I need access to the curriculum? I want to see for myself if the school system really teaches the meaning of liberty and justice for all. I really do. I'm not sure really uh, a good segment of Americans really know what those two words really mean. And I want to see whether, you know, we have enough foreign culture and foreign languages in the curriculum. Because if you listen to what's happening today outside our borders and can affect all of us in the most drastic way, our leaders, which are the school students when they grow up, they need to understand the world outside. And the way to understand the world outside and the mindset is by learning foreign languages and foreign cultures. I really want access to the curriculum. I just want to see. So for half a million dollars, may I, Mr. Chair, can I have access? Thank you. Dr. Farone, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Muhammad Jamil. Good evening, peace and blessings to all, including those who are virtually attending the meeting. We have entered the first quarter of this blessed year. Before we know it, the end of the school year will be upon us. Last year was a year of revelations because of COVID. It made the societies realize the importance of relationships and the fragility of mankind. Six million lives have been lost as of yesterday, including one million of our own citizens. The gluttonous appetite for material things reduced, which also resulted in some becoming unemployed. You understand what I mean. We are all in the same boat. This epidemic also exposed the potholes in all aspects of our society, 
whether it is the health system or administrative operations in the government sector as well as in the private sector. Many brick and mortar facilities became less important if not unnecessary. Educational institutions have been no exception. As we have heard all those issues that have been brought just today. We must not let the lessons learned go by. There must be collaborative contemplation, evaluation, and innovation to recalibrate the current operations and methods of educating our children today as well as tomorrow. The debate about providing the education to the students in person or virtually is still going on. Either method has to be weighed in for the pros and cons relating to needs of the teachers, delivery of curricula, socializing, sports, mental health, and relevancy of brick and mortar facilities, and not to mention the need of figuring out the appropriate logistics of transportation. Many in the private sector noted increase in productivity due to virtual operations. Environment in general improved. Lesser commuting and fuel consumption resulted in reduction of volume of exhaust from the vehicles. Noise pollution also reduced benefiting the animals of the air. Anyhow, my passion being education and community service, I could not ignore a serious deficiency in the field of education. The national president of 4-H revealed that 55 million school children, not college or university students, did not have computers or any access to internet. It was also noted that our teachers faced quite many challenges. This president has organized distribution of free computers, as many as the 4-H can afford. I hope that BCPS is preparing to meet these challenges next school year for the future. Thank you, Mr. Jamil. Ms. Jen Burton. Hello, I'm Jen Burton, a mother of two boys in first and fourth grade at Carroll Manor Elementary School. I'm the vice president of our school's PTA, former BCPS employee and current substitute teacher. I'm a very involved parent and will continue to be. In the words of BCPS, if you see something, say something. So I'm here to say I'm disappointed in BCPS. I'm here tonight to advocate for better student teacher ratios and to take action on behavior in schools across the county. Why do student teacher ratios matter? Student teacher ratios have been found to be one of the strongest indicators of student success. BCPS have and continue to fail our children. Our children are falling behind at alarming rates and cannot catch up. Many are below grade level for reading and math. BCPS plans to cut more teachers next year and class sizes will increase. Larger class sizes lead to more distraction, less learning and increased behaviors. Following a pandemic and lack of consistent schooling for the past two years, we need more teachers, not less. Many children are now on IEPs. This is just means these children need more attention and guidance from their teachers. They need more small group and individual time with teachers. This is not possible with class sizes nearing or over 30 students. This is not possible when behaviors are taking all the time of the teachers. This is not possible when teachers are being pulled for meetings. Children are not only failing behind, falling behind academically, but their social emotional needs are not being met. We need to increase teacher and teachers and support staff to bring these students back to grade level academically, socially, and emotionally. We need more teachers in small class sizes. If we don't take action now, more students will leave BCPS and that's even less funding for our future students. Having lower student teacher ratios will not only benefit students, but will benefit our teachers and support staff. Teachers can focus on teaching and connecting with students on an emotional level. Teachers can focus on individual student needs and give them the attention and support they so desperately need. We need to take action now to support our teachers. If we have learned anything in the past two years, it is that our teachers are invaluable. They are the key to our students' success. If they are overworked, stressed, and not supported, they cannot provide the best education they can for our children. They do not feel supported by BCPS because they're not. 
We are losing teachers and staff from being overworked. Our children and our students depend on good teacher, teachers for their future. They are teaching the future of our next generation. Next, I would like to bring up unacceptable behaviors in the school system. In our small community at Carroll Manor, we have seen an increase of behavioral problems. From what I'm reading and hearing on the news, this is not only a countywide but worldwide problem post-pandemic. Children are, are only so resilient. We can only expect so much from them. BCPS needs rules, BCPS needs consequences, and most of all, BCPS needs to follow through. We should not hear about a fight, a weapon, an arrest, a threat, etc., on the news almost daily from BCPS. What is it going to take? Thank you, Ms. Burton. That concludes our speaker portion of the agenda. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report, and for that, I call on Dr. Williams. Good evening, Vice Ch Chair McMillian and members of the board. I'm pleased to present my superintendent's report to the board and team BCPS. My report includes celebrations, operational updates, and evidence of our strategic plan, the compass, our pathway to excellence in education. So I'd like to start by celebrating the accomplishments of our student athletes who are in the playoff season. Tonight, Pikesville girls and tomorrow, Hereford girls. Overly boys and Parkville boys will compete. We wish them the best of luck in the semifinals. A shout out to our wrestlers who competed over the weekend. Congratulations to our six state champions. And our girls, we have Yugochi, Onanobi of Randallstown High School, Elena Kopalchik of Perry Hall High School, and Sarah Sunday of Delaney High School. For our boys, we have Dom, Dom Ambrosino of Sparrows Point. We have Justin Briscoe of Woodlawn High School, and Cage, excuse me, Gage Carr of Sparrows Point High School. So congratulations to our student athletes. We can clap. March is Women's History Month. Next slide, please. And today is International Women's Day. So please join us in celebrating the achievements and contributions of women throughout history and around the world. This week, take a moment to say thank you to our wonderful Team BCPS school social workers. Our social workers provide students, families, and schools with mental health, academic, and classroom support. Social workers help make our community stronger, and we appreciate their contributions. In honor of National School Social Work Week, BCPS will present a profile each weekday of one of its talented and dedicated school social workers. It is also National School Breakfast Week. I'd like to give a shout out to our food and nutrition team for all they do to ensure that all BCPS students have a healthy start to their school day. We average 38,000 breakfasts each day. So congratulations and thank you to our food and nutrition team. Please join me in congratulating the four winners of the 2022 Black History Month Writing Contest. In the first category, grades kindergarten to second grade winner is Logan Aldafata, grade two from Logan Elementary School. The next category, grades three through five winner, Kendall Brown, grade four, Riderwood Elementary School. The next category is grade six to eight winner, Gabby Perillman, Perillin, grade six, Arbutus Middle School, and grades nine through 12 winner, we have Lauren Blair, grade nine, Catonsville High School. Congratulations, students. We know that our efforts to heal, rebuild, and recover must be ongoing. Slowly but surely, we are seeing signs of the next normal. Mask optional, spring sports, and end of the year celebrations are points towards continued healing. 
so members of Team BCPS met with our health partners from the University of Maryland and Johns Hopkins University on Thursday. We provided an update to Team BCPS regarding additional mitigation today. As you know, masks are optional in Baltimore County public schools and facilities. We understand that the decision to wear or not wear a mask is a personal choice. Every student and staff member should feel supported in making the decision that is best for them. BCPS will not tolerate any bullying, harassment, or intimidation when it comes to the choices students and staff make about masking. Additionally, effective immediately, weekly testing will be optional for unvaccinated BCPS staff, student athletes, and students participating in extracurricular activities. Visitors and volunteers can resume in-person visits to schools. All visitors and volunteers must follow COVID-19 safety protocols in place at the time of their visit and activity. There will be no restriction on spectator capacity for all spring athletic events and other extracurricular activities. All BCPS high schools will host traditional indoor and outdoor activities to recognize the academic and athletic achievements of the class of 2022. Additionally, schools are planning to host spring concerts, plays, recognition events, and end of the year celebrations. School specific information about these events will be shared with communities in the upcoming weeks. BCPS will continue to take the following steps to protect the health of students and staff. One, increase access to school-based vaccination clinics in collaboration with our Baltimore County Department of Health. Two, optional weekly testing will continue to be offered at no cost to staff and students through the end of the school year. Three, monitoring disease trends and guidance from our public health leaders. Four, distribution of additional KN95 masks. And five, utilizing comprehensive health and safety strategies, including daily cleaning, providing access to COVID-19 testing, case monitoring, contact tracing, and quarantine. As a reminder, please visit our COVID-19 website for more information. At this time, I would like to invite our Deputy Superintendent, Dr. Yarborough, to provide a brief efficiency review report update. A more extensive update is scheduled for the March 22nd board meeting. Dr. Yarborough. Morale, communication, and stakeholder satisfaction. Dr. Williams further stated that based on a preliminary review, BCPS would realize a cost savings ranging from $6 million to $7 million in year one. To date, items number one and number two have been completed, and item number three is in progress. An update on the comprehensive climate and communications plans are scheduled for the spring. Responsible cost reductions in the amount of $7.7 million have been realized. These savings include a reduction of 9.0 FTEs, totaling $1.7 million through the reorganization of cabinet and $6 million through device cost reductions. Next slide, please. A 759-page review of our system requires a balanced and studied approach for successful implementation. As a reminder, three types of work groups were created. This slide shows the three types of groups that have been involved in and reviewing and assessing the recommendations in each chapter. Division work groups, the blueprint review team, and the stakeholder work group. Next slide, please. This slide categorizes the type of recommendations in each chapter. The 197 recommendations included work directly related to divisions, personnel slash reorganization items, policy changes, board of education items, 
and the category other, which included items specific to the survey results, climate, metrics, and the communications. Next slide, please. To date, 189 out of the 197 recommendations have been processed by members of Team BCPS. Eight items remain. This slide provides a summary of outcomes by chapter. 106 recommendations have moved forward with a de determination of yes as written. 44 have moved forward with yes with modifications. 14 no and seven recommendations have been held for further study and review for FY24 implementation for additional input and an opportunity for newly developed structures and leadership to assess needs. Next slide, please. To date, 96% of our recommendations have been processed. 4% or 26 recommendations do not have a final determination. 18 of those have been returned to the division work groups from the stakeholder work group for additional clarification and refinement. Two will be forwarded to the policy review committee and six are assigned directly to the Board of Education. Next slide, please. The overall rate of implementation for efficiency review recommendations that the Public Works LLC project director has led averages 80% across school districts. To date, of the 171 recommendations that have a final determination, BCPS has moved forward 88%, that is 150 items, with a yes. This number exceeds the implementation average by 8%. 8% 8 have moved forward 14 items with a no, and 4% have moved forward with a determination to hold for further review and consideration. The next efficiency update will include details related to implementation of all accepted recommendations. Next slide, please. As a reminder, we have created a web page that members of the public can use to access artifacts related to system review and implementation. It contains links to agendas and action items for all chapter division work groups, blueprint review team, and the multi-stakeholder work group. Additionally, Superintendent, efficiency review updates, and related communication are archived on this page. It is dynamic and will continue to change as materials and artifacts become available. Thank you for your time and attention. I turn it back over to Dr. Williams. Thank you, Dr. Yarborough. We will continue to update the board and our community and Team BCPS during these changing times. I want to thank you so much for your continued support and engagement in this work. And this concludes the superintendent's report. Ms. Causey has a question. Dr. Williams. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you, uh, Dr. Garborough. Uh, so in, thank you for uh, that presentation. I believe that was added today uh, to our board doc, so I wasn't able to review it. If you could put back up the slide that has the number that are implemented. Does the number of recommendations that are labeled yes, does that include those that are, are Yes, but delayed by a year from the Public Works recommendation. So we have seven items, I believe, that have been held uh, for review for FY24. And if we look at slide number 12, it tells you what chapter they're coming from. So five of them are in chapter two, and two of them are in chapter eight. So I would have to take a look. Um, and let you know anything uh, more directly. Okay, thank you. And, and were those that were in the, the same, that were in the operating budget document that was presented to the board and then it was also attached to board docs? So this has been updated as of March 5th. So there are additional updates to this. And to answer directly, a yes or a yes with modifications is not included in the FY24 category. So the, let me, <clears throat> let me see if, to clarify this. So the recommendations in the operating budget document that were labeled postponed to fiscal year 24 um, are not included in the yeses. 
as everything as of March 5th is updated in this document. So there are some FY24s that still remain in FY24, and those are the seven in this document. Okay, so I just wanted to clarify because there were significant ones with savings, but also organizational effectiveness that were requested or recommended to be implemented in fiscal year 23. So um, that's a concern of mine, but thank you for that. So just to make a comment, <coughs> the savings were presented to the board. Let me back up. The superintendent's report is usually something that I present. We usually don't have questions. And as it was articulated, a much more extensive report about the efficiency review will be presented to the board on March 22nd. In terms of the savings, we have followed the savings for the first year and the estimation of what that will look like over five years based on Public Works LLC. What you receive with the budget is aligned with the recommendations and there were several that were put on hold as we were going through the reorganization as I presented to the board during my budget presentation back in January. So any additional questions, we'll be happy to entertain that when we present the update on the on the efficiency on March 22nd. So thank you. Thank you. Dr. Yarborough, thank you. Dr. Williams, thank you. thank you. The next item on the agenda is the chair's report. Is Ms. Hen by chance on this call? Doesn't appear to be. I have no chair report. We're going to move on to the next item on the agenda is the student board members report. And for that, I call on Mr. Christian Thomas. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Was my mic on? Oh, yeah. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. And good evening, everyone. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to visit two of the most influential places in my life, Middlesex Elementary and Stummers Run Middle School. I walked the same halls I did four, seven, 13 years ago. I talked with the teachers who helped shape me into the person I am today. And most importantly, I had the opportunity to meet with the students sitting in the very seats I used to sit in and talk with them about their concerns. It was a very reflective visit as I am nearing the end of my journey as both a student and board member here in Baltimore County Public Schools. It reminded me of the power of education, the incredible progress our school system has made since my term began, or since my time began in kindergarten 13 years ago, and the people who make our schools not just places to learn, but second homes for our diverse population. As I toured my old schools, I started to think of my little siblings and their journey in elementary and middle schools. Each of us have had our unique experience here in, in BCPS, attending different schools, but finding the same welcoming communities with the same support in each of them. And this idea, or, or the, my siblings in, in each of the schools that, we've been that they've attended being different schools because of um, a move that we had across the street, we moved across the street and a boundary that uh, made us switch our entire school communities. And this idea of boundaries snapped me back to the boardroom and the conversation we'll be having tonight about the new Northeast elementary school boundaries. As I have been visiting schools from the southwest part of our county to the northeast, one thing that is clear is the diversity of our system. But another clear thing I've noticed is, while some of our schools are diverse learning systems, others are not as diverse. While some of our schools have a population and boundary lines reflective of our system's diversity, others do not have one as prominent. Take two of our high schools, for example. In the west zone, we have Milford Mill Academy with a total minority enrollment rate of 99% while in the central zone, we have Hereford High School with a total minority enrollment rate of 13%. Of course, these schools are miles away, one in an urban setting and another in a rural area of BCPS. But shouldn't we be questioning this? Shouldn't we be taking a look at our boundaries constantly? Shouldn't we be trying to break this stark difference between two of our high schools? Tonight, we'll be looking at, at schools in a five mile radius as we draw lines for the new Northeast Elementary School. But that radius shows a similar stark in diversity contrast, you know, not as stark, but similar. While one school, Perry Hall Elementary School, is projected to have a total minority rate of 54%, why is another school, Shady Spring Elementary School, projected to have an enrollment student minority rate of 94%? Shouldn't we be working our very best to try and ensure that our student demographics in each of our schools represents the student demographics of our system overall? Because I think so. Why aren't we actively trying to combat the de facto segregation that still persists in, our, persists in our communities around Baltimore County? Because we should be. I know from visiting schools 
that we haven't left the remnants of segregation in the past and from contacting the creators of tonight's boundary recommendations, Cropper, that we can and we should do more to do this. We can bring a heightened focus to our boundary studies on ensuring that our demographics aren't so different between schools. We can make that very fact a priority for our boundaries instead of just throwing them into the mix of dozens of other factors. So we can work to ensure the continued limit of diversities in some communities of Baltimore County are not leading to diversity, lack of diversity in the classrooms. As our next boundary studies begin to develop, you know, not the one just tonight, but in the future as well, with new schools and new construction projects, I ask you all to think of this. I ask you all to take action to prevent another boundary study recommendation from coming forward to the board for a vote that doesn't make diversity a main priority in drawing the maps of our, bound, of our school system. Finally, I want to remind every student in BCPS that voting for the next student member of the board will occur on March 17th, 2022. Every sixth through 12th grade student will have the opportunity to have their voice heard and select who will sit in this very seat up at the board dais. Bring their voice, bring the voice of their peers and the students across the county to this board and join in the process to continue making our system more equitable and more responsive to student needs. I know that both of our finalists, Masa and Roa, would make incredible student advocates with all of you on this Board of Education. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that, I call on Mr. Mercedes. Good evening, Mr. McMillian. Nothing to report from closed session. Thank you very much. The next item is contract awards, and for that, I call on Ms. Joe Joe's Chairman of the Building and Contracts Committee. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, members of the board, the board's Building and Contracts Committee met Monday, March 7, 2022. Items L1 through L22 are being forwarded to the full board with uh, full approval from the committee uh, unanimously. However, Mr. Hartlow. Good evening, board members, uh, Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Williams. Uh, exhibit uh, L18, 18. Pikesville High School running track surface replacement is being pulled from tonight's agenda. Thank you. Thank you. I will now move to approve items L1 through L8 and L12 to L16. No second is needed. Any discussion? Ms. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, earlier I emailed a request to separate for recusal purposes contract number 17, 19 through 22 and to separate for discussion contract number 9, 10, and 11. They have been separated. Thank you. Okay. Do I have a motion? Do we've already done that? We have a second. Any discussion? Any additional discussion? Okay. May I have a roll call? Let's go over. I should read that. Excuse me, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Can you just repeat the numbers again? Yes. Do I have a motion to approve items? Okay. We have the motion. It is 1 through 8 and 12 through 16 is motion 1. So we're going to deal with those. Okay? Thank you. Ms. Gover, can I have a vote, a roll call vote for motions, excuse me, for contracts 1 through 8 and 12 through 16? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Jose, we have a second motion. Yes. I move the board approves contract L17. L19 through L22. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? So we're voting on L17 and then L19 through 22. I'm saying L, but it's 19, 17 and 19 through 22. Any discussion? 
Okay. Ms. Gover, can I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Recused. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Jose? I move the board approves contracts L9, L10, and L11. Do we have a second? L9, L10, and L11. Ms. Causey? Were we going to separate those out? We had talked about it. Is this a recusal, Ms. Causey, or discussion? Uh, discussion and voting. So the separately. interest of time, Mr. McMillian and I decided to club it together. You could ask questions in all three. We could separate it out if you it's up to the chair. We actually, we had a conversation among several of us, and we talked about separating nine into motion three, 10 into motion four, and 11 into motion five. Are you comfortable okay. with that, Ms. Jose? Okay. So you move. I will withdraw my motion then and move the board approves contract L9. Okay. Do I have a second for L9? Anybody? I don't believe a second is needed. We don't need a second? Okay. So any discussion on L9? Ms. Causey. Uh, thank you, Mr. McMillian. Um, and I appreciate the uh, separating them out. Um, so this contract uh, is, if I could just have um, uh, staff unpack it a little bit and then um, I can ask my question. It'll make more sense. <laughs> Sure. Uh, Excuse me, Mr. Uh, Hartlove. I will ask Mr. Augusto to come to the table. Ms. Calder, we would appreciate your question at this time so the staff will be able to respond. Certainly. So this contract goes back to 2017, and it has 39 vendors, and the dollar amounts are uh, $41 million that's been spent over the last several years. Um, and the increase is significant as well. Um, I believe it's 16 million additional dollars. And I understand from the Building and Contracts Committee that was held yesterday that there were um, discussion about understanding uh, the totality of the technology plan moving forward. And what seems to be happening is that we are uh, being, the board is being asked to approve 40 million for projectors. Uh, 40 million is a new, um, newly competitive bid um, contract for laptops. This is a asking for increase in modification uh, to this current contract that was uh, approved initially in 2017, which is before this board was seated. Um, so my question is um, specifically, there is no evaluation provided, it says on that contract, uh, for any of the vendors, although at $41 million, uh, it, it, it should have been. So I'm just curious about the evaluation and the, in, the individual contractors that um, received the, the most significant portion. Uh, from a procurement perspective, I can say that this is uh, a MEEK, uh, that's a Maryland Education Enterprise Consor Consortium um, bid. Many jurisdictions throughout the state of Maryland, University of Maryland, many uh, jurisdictions use this uh, procurement vehicle. Um, with It has very favorable uh, pricing. So it's, it's, it's a typical type of uh, vehicle that we use for these types of of, of procurements. Uh, the specifics I'd, I'd, I'd leave to Mr. Augusto. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> in terms of what this is including, the, the request for um, authorization is, um, and as I mentioned in the uh, contracts meeting, so this is for the network equipment and separating this from, I know there was a question about um, 
strategically, how does this affect, or how is it affected by the, the path we're moving for more cloud-based systems? This is our um, <clears throat> network request. So this includes items that would be needed regardless of whether we're on-prem or, or on cloud systems. So this is a request for our um, networking core and switch um, infrastructure. This also includes the, um, the estimated the school network equipment for um, a couple of the schools. This also includes um, the request for paying the um, remaining lease payments for the firewalls that we procured uh, post ransomware attack. So this particular contract request or the um, authorization request is to cover the network services. Now, I agree with your statement and statement made uh, at the contracts meeting that um, we provide a strategic plan and that is part of my goals is with the assessment gathering that we're looking at. Um, are we where we need to be? Are we requesting the funds adequately where, based on where we want to be year one, year three, year five? Thank you for that, and I do appreciate um, that both of you are new in your positions, and we welcome you to Team BCPS, um, but I also believe it would be prudent to delay for two weeks so you could do a deep dive into some of the procurement aspects um, of these large, complicated Time. programs. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Any additional questions? So, Ms. Gover, we're going to vote on number nine. Correct. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Abstain. Ms. Mack? Abstain. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. We're going to move on to Ms. Jose. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I move the board approve contract L10. Any discussion? Ms. Causey? Thank you. I have a quick question. This contract goes back to 2008, and um, over time, I've been on the board since 2015. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask the question, um, has the vendor agreement for student data privacy been updated with this vendor? This is, I believe this is another um, Meek uh, contract. So I would, I, I, my understanding is they're pretty thorough in, 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 in what they do. So I, yes. Good. Uh, Mr. Causey, th this contract does not involve the actual procurement of Microsoft Office 365 products. This is for the professional support that Microsoft provides us as a tier one escalation. So they do not come in contact with student data in this work. And if they do, we have NDAs put in place as we bring in those contractors. Thank you so much for that. Ms. Rowe. What's the hourly rate for that? Uh, Ms. Rowe, it's, it's a... This a, is, yeah, this is, this is not a labor contract. This is a subscription for services that Microsoft provides. So this is their um, access to Premier Services Knowledge Base. This is access to uh, escalated um, tier, uh, higher level tier support. Should any of our technicians or anybody in DOIT need Microsoft support? Okay, so how are they billing that? Is it per it's a, ticket it's a, it's or a subscription? It? No, it's you pay an annual fee. This is on a subscription basis. What is the annual fee? Is it the one point four? Right. So it's the actual ask. Here's the um, on an annual basis one point four million. So how are they calculating that based on the size of our system or the size of our network? Or because I've seen a lot of variable rates for that service from Microsoft, and I'd like to know how they're calculating hours. Okay, so unless you know, Jim, I, I know it's not gonna be based on hours, it's based on um, 
yeah. our environment size, right? Yeah, that's that's correct. And um, there's a hundred there's a, there are 180 hours listed in here of uh, our support account management. And uh, as Mr. Augusto was saying, the spending authority increases also over several years, Ms. Rosa. That 1.4 is going to be not for just the singular year, but several. So this is the escalation service that we used um, heavily when um, the cyber attack was occurring to bring Microsoft in for hardening of equipment. As Mr. Gosa was also pointing out, this is a service that we use for escalation of our technicians for training. So um, there, there is an hourly uh, list of 180 hours per year for this, uh, but that is um, a, kind of a, uh, a break glass moment uh, for some of the other numbers, like this 40 hours of 24-7 on uh, support for on-prem things when stuff goes down. Mm -hmm. So the hours are spelled out heavily in the contractual um, uh, document uh, as far as how we can do our incident response and our support. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any additional questions? Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I just have a quick question. Um, so there are 108 hours of 180 hours of support are built into this contract. Is, is that what was just stated? Uh, so, uh, so, Mr. Thomas, there's several uh, notes in here. We have 180 hours of uh, support account management. That's uh, an incident uh, response manager and things of that nature. So we have 40 hours of 24 by 7 support. So if something happens 3 o'clock in, in the morning, we'll, we'll get escalated service. So there's a, a whole list of different things they'll offer and for us. Right. Okay, thank you. And so then... How do we usually meet that amount, like the 180 hours, the 40 hours, or is this just kind of a safety measure in case we need it? Or so I guess I, I don't. We've uh, never. Ex uh, I shouldn't say we never have exceeded it, but uh, it, it's usually met our needs. Uh, but it is uh, a little bit like an insurance policy. So there may be times when we do go with uh, unencumbered. I will say that Microsoft uh, has worked with us in partnership in order to also provide hourly trainings for different things, where we've kind of taken some of these hours and said, if we have extra, we can use them for something else. Okay, thank you so much. Any additional questions? Ms. Gober, can we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Abstain. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Ms. Jose, we have one more, correct? Yes. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Uh, I move the board approve contract, board approves contract L11. Any discussion? L11. Ms. Causey. Thank you. If you could just go over the amounts and the um, procurement method for this contract, please. Okay, so the, in terms of the amount, um, so for the, uh, the, the first fiscal year that we're requesting the authority, which is uh, $16 million, um, what that includes is the um, uh, authorization to, uh, for, for funding for um, replacement of, or 18,000 staff devices, which is for, um, administrators, teachers, anybody using desktop, laptop equipment. Um, that also includes the, as we mentioned here, the refresh of the CTE, um, the uh, magnet labs, and then also fine arts. So that's part of the plan that we had. I had mentioned uh, a couple of board meetings ago, we were looking at, and based on comments about evaluating the environment uh, that are in these labs. Um, that's included um, in the 16 million, and then also um, it includes. And what I do want to mention is that it does um, include the, the price tag includes not only the device, but the peripherals, so that the loading dock. Uh, the, I'm sorry, the docking station, um, the support uh, break fix plan for four years on the equipment. So it is a package. So it isn't just for the device. It's all the other things that go along with it. Thank you. I appreciate that uh, quick response to um, comments from the schoolhouse about what's needed to help the children really utilize the technology effectively 
for their career uh, designation, what they're working towards, or uh, their other curriculum. So uh, definitely appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions? Mr. Mr. Kuhn. Thanks again. I asked you a bunch of questions yesterday, but I'm going to ask a, full, a few more, and I may ask the same one just so everyone can hear. Sure. So um, this is to replace these laptops that we have here. Yeah. And damn it. Sorry, I can't see this. All right, so these laptops are going away and new ones will be cycled in. Is it gonna happen in a staggered approach or is it gonna be a big bang, they all come in year one? Because I know it's, it's a lease we're talking about, correct? Correct, so the, uh, the plan is, it, it is gonna be in a staggered plan, but it's in terms of the duration, it's within the fiscal year. Um, one of the logistical challenges we'll have is working with our vendor to procure the equipment through supply chain, um, bring them in, get them through. But once we have them, they're going to go out. And um, I mentioned this in uh, yesterday's call. Uh, again, the replacement of the machines in the labs will be in a staggered approach. We'll be working in conjunction with uh, curriculum and also um, the lab facilitators to make sure that we're addressing the labs that need, that have the most outdated equipment, either have insufficient equipment based on the specs for the software that they should be running, and those will be at a higher priority. All right, thank you. And then, um, so Mr. Saris was here last night. Mr. Hartlove, you're here tonight. Could you please provide the, the spreadsheet that shows the expenditures year over year We've been provided that in the past so that we could actually see the money flowing out based on the leases and when things kind of expire. We can provide that through the superintendent, yes. All right, thank you. Okay, Mr. Mr. Thomas, next. Thank you. So I'm reading the contract and it says, this contract will allow, sorry, for continuation of the one-to-one -one device program for provide access to technology for students and staff. So does this contract include Chromebooks? This, this program does not include Chromebooks. This is only for, uh, the Chromebooks are on a separate procurement. Right. This is for staff devices and for um, refresh of the labs. Okay, so when it says the continuation of the one-to-one -one device program, that's not including the student devices because student devices are gonna be Chromebooks. Correct. Okay, thank you. Mr. Kuhn, did you have another question? Okay, Ms. Rowe? So, um, is it our intention to continue with the Chromebooks for students and then for the Windows devices for staff and labs? Yes, it is. Um, the specs for the Chrome devices will meet uh, students' day-to-day -day needs. Um, this particular, um, the, the procurement and the statement of work that we spec'd out will include two models of um, computing computers one for normal day-to-day -day staff use, and then the other for have a um, higher spec um, memory and CPU requirements for um, resource-intensive software applications that could be running in the lab. Okay, and so for some of our art students who, or even some of our CTE students, that they're doing a lot of things at home as well, are those students going to have a Windows device that they can take home and continue using to do their homework or whatever, or is it a situation where the Windows device will only be in the lab, so they have to be in the school building and in that class in order to do the work? Yeah, so right now, uh, <clears throat> the way this is planned out is we're looking at the lab environment. So um, any um, exceptions to that will need to be identified. Uh, part of this, um, Request for equipment also includes a certain amount for of stock for break fix or mm -hmm. any one-off items. So right now, so yes, the plan is this is the scope is only the lab equipment. Okay, are we doing anything as far as um, Windows devices for Vex Robotics clubs or anything, or is that just a separate thing? Um, if those clubs are not included in either the, the standard CTE program, um, 
I'm assuming fine arts or magnet, they're not included in the scope. So those would have to be, if there's a specific environment set up for the robotics club, that would have to come to our attention okay. and we'd have to address that. Thank you. Ms. Scott. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, to follow up on that, it says it's the one-to-one -one device program to provide technology for students and staff. So those are the technology you're talking about are the devices that'll be in uh, a computer lab. Is that correct? Two, yes, um, computer labs and then also staff. So computer labs. Ex, um, minus students. The, the ones who currently have Chromebooks is not included in this. This is uh, solely for staff in the computer labs. Okay, and um, and maybe this would be for um, Dr. Williams or maybe for you all, but um, what sort of activities or what sort of um, things would they be doing in the computer lab on these devices? Yeah, I would have to... Um, give that to somebody in curriculum. Yeah, I would know. I, Scott, I give you a very cursory level. So mm -hmm. we um, we use uh, software uh, for some of our fine arts programs, like the Adobe Suite, uh, Photoshop, um, InDesign, um, uh, Premiere, things of that nature. Those are PC exclusive. Uh, they don't have a Chromebook. Um, uh, correlation, as well as our um, our CTE programs like Project Lead the Way, which does Autodesk, Inventor, and uh, Revit, and some additional software that are uh, ex exclusively PC. And so that's what uh, really drives this need, is we, we've worked with CTE and Fine Arts to identify anything that a, a Chrome extension or a Chrome uh, app, or um, an Android app that might run on our Chromebooks would uh, supplant. Mm -hmm. uh, but these are the ones that will be um, unable to be replaced by any uh, lighter version of themselves. So that, that really heavy um, need uh, in, in our magnet programs, in our CTE programs, fine arts programs for uh, Windows-based software. So that's what's really driving this lab scenario. Okay, great. Thank you, because I wasn't sure if this, if, um, what it would be used for, but thank you for that. Any additional questions? Ms. Causey. Two quick ones. Um, we've heard a lot from staff that our paraeducators and our adult assistants uh, wanted to utilize technology so that they can support the students in the way that they're learning. So does this contract support uh, those staff members receiving or uh, technology or are they receiving Chromebooks or they're not scheduled? I know they yeah. had been scheduled, but we had some adjustments that had to be made during COVID and uh, with the ransom attack. So if the population you're talking about is staff, um, BCPCS staff, then yes, this covers um, the replacement and upgrade for staff equipment. Okay. Um, but if they didn't get them initially because of, there are some staff members that may have been delayed in receiving their technology due to um, the... Uh, pandemic and having to send a lot more students home with technology and then the ransom attack where they had to utilize our supply <clears throat> to um, exchange. So the, uh, the the people that were receiving the, or that were to receive the technology are students or staff? I just want to be clear. Staff, paraeducators and adult okay. assistants. And if, yes. and if you don't have the answer, you no, can so, provide it. Right, so later. a couple things. So yes, they're in scope. Um, what we haven't talked about because we're not in the execution phase on this is how we plan out the rollout because as uh, Mr. Coons had mentioned um, or he asked the questions, this is, this is going to be on a staggered rollout. So we have to work all those logistics out, who gets what, when. Okay, thank you. And the other is um, it says it's a new competitively bid contract um, and that uh, the number of vendors – Requesting was 51 and bids received was seven, um, but it, d it doesn't say whether the bid was chosen because it was low cost. Is it also the lowest cost? Because we see that sometimes on some of our contracts. I, I believe when we, uh, when, when bidders are qualified, then we go low, low cost. So as long as they're qualified, they would, they would, uh, they would receive the, the, the bid at low cost. Yeah. So, Mr. Cause, this was both based on responsiveness of the bid as well as um, we, we were able to select the lowest cost uh, product. That's fantastic. Thank you. Any additional questions? Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Uh, so, I'm not sure right now if all of our secondary schools currently have computer labs. Do we currently have computer labs in all the secondary schools? Uh, we, 
every all the secondary schools do, right? I think we learned. Yeah, yeah. we learned when our, our at our meeting yesterday that all schools have a, yes. have at least one lab, including all secondary schools. Do elementary schools have a computer lab? I don't, no, not elementary schools. The discussion we had was all okay. secondary schools. Awesome. And so then for these. Uh, for these programs that we're discussing, like uh, Premier, like Adobe, elementary school students wouldn't be using those in fourth and fifth grade classes, uh, for example, so they wouldn't need to have computer labs? Or uh, I'm wondering, would elementary school students also need to use these, these products? Yeah, so that's a question I can't answer, because all we do is outfit, we will provide the specs for them as far as the use and plan for any of the labs we don't know. Okay, I was just wondering um, as to you know, where this contract would be implemented in, in our system. Um, and then when we're discussing the Windows-based devices, are those for the computer labs? When I was in a computer lab, you know, we had like the box devices and the, and the attached screens, but are, we, are they now laptops in the computer labs or are they still the big so boxes? This is, no, this is a mix, and, I, and Jim, you can correct me. I think in the lab, um, they're primarily gonna be desktop, is that correct? And then um, uh, if, if they need, if uh, from a uh, price point, if we can make use with a lab, but um, or sorry, with a with a um, laptop, but they are we spec'd out desktops for the lab. And so, uh, as Mr. Gosa was saying, we, we've we've actually got four devices in this bid. There's a uh, I'm going to call it the high end desktop, which is for that real heavy lift. Uh, we've got a high end laptop in case there's a need for that, um, based on space issues of the school and, and things of that nature. Uh, we have a, uh, a standard laptop and a standard desktop that are also involved as well. So um, where we really work, uh, Mr. Thomas, is uh, we spend a lot of time with our curriculum and instruction team to really talk about um, how curriculum aligns to the needs of the devices. So um, in the instance when you ask like what programs might we use in the elementary, the middle, or the high, those are really conversations that we partner heavily with uh, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Basil Comas and her team to find out what what need are we addressing and what device would do that um, while being fiscally responsible. Thank you. And the reason I was asking about the the devices, whether they're laptops or you know desktops, and thank you for giving me the words to describe them, um, was because you know there was a comment about Vex Robotics and other clubs using these programs. So if there's a high level laptop that can be transported throughout the school with a computer lab, you know that might be more effective. So I'm glad to see that there are those high level desktops and laptops involved in this contract. And going back to a, another question about paraeducators, um, will or will not, or will paraeducators not be given devices, um, these staff devices with contracts? Are they included in this staff uh, group? So, uh, Mr. Thomas, the, the clarity on that is this. Uh, we had been requested by um, paras, paraeducators to have devices so they could participate in student learning. Mm -hmm. uh, paraeducators have been issued Chromebooks because that is what our students are using to engage in their learning. So it directly mirrors the environment. So these, these devices are going to focus in on our professional staff, our certificated staff, um, and our uh, uh, f clerical front office staff, our nursing staff, uh, those individuals. Our paras have been issued uh, Chromebooks to utilize uh, that have the functionality to mirror exactly what the students are seeing that they're supporting. Yeah, and I, thank you for, for, for that clarification, for explaining that. So, and will adult assistants also have Chromebooks or... Is it just paraeducators? Um, we, we focused in on paraeducators. As uh, Ms. Causey alluded to, uh, during the pandemic, we had to make a lot of different shifts. But now that we're back to uh, uh, in-person instruction, those needs are shifting. OK. Thank you so much. Ms. Rowe. So it's my understanding from some emails I've gotten from different school staff members that also every school has a television studio and that the television studio's computing needs for video production mirrors that of some of our CTE labs and our um, art programs and magnet programs. Are all of the television studios also going to be getting upgraded devices? So, Ms. Rowe, those television studios are run on TriCasters. And those TriCasters are a closed system that are procured through a specific vendor uh, that this board has approved uh, 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 several contracts uh, since I've been here. But those uh, TriCasters are a closed Windows box. Um, so these devices, we could not install that TriCaster software on. Okay, so are we, are we updating the television studio's devices 
through a different contract then? So it's, there is a different contract that supports that. Uh, those uh, refreshes are run through a different office than uh, DOIT. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they've been working through uh, uh, budgetary uh, efforts to make sure that we have refreshes and updates to, um, to that hardware. But I could get you more information um, through Dr. Williams from, from that group. Sure, if we could do that in an mm -hmm. update, that'd be great, thanks. Okay, Ms. Gover, roll call vote, please. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Abstain. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Kuhn? Yes. Mr. Kuhn, sorry. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, gentlemen. The next item on the agenda is the state mask mandate, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. So good evening, board members. Uh, this item was added to this week's agenda based on our February 22nd meeting. Uh, since then, we provided the board and the community an update regarding our masks. And so the team has nothing to present this evening. We have no additional information to provide we provided to the board and the community at this time. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Mr. Thomas. Yes, I, I do just have one quick question. I haven't had a look at the BCPS COVID-19 dashboard. I'm wondering, have there been an uptick in cases since the masks were optional or are we steady still? I'm just wondering. We're studying been... that at this time. We do not see, we are not able to provide that answer at this time. Okay, awesome, thank you. Okay. Next item on the agenda is consideration of the new Northeast Area Elementary School boundary. And for that, I call on Dr. Zarchin and Mr. Dixit. So joining this team is Mr. Paul Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Paul Taylor, for being here. So, good evening, Vice Chair, Mr. McMillian, uh, Dr. Williams, Superintendent Dr. Williams, members of the board. Uh, I'll just give you a little bit of uh, background information about the purpose of our being here. Um, we are here to reintroduce for board approval the recommendation of the Northeast Area Elementary School Boundary Study Committee. As part of the $1.6 billion capital plan, known as Schools for Our Future, BCPS implemented two elementary school construction projects in the Northeast area to improve facility condition and relieve overcrowding. One project is a new elementary school at Ridge Road, and the second is the replacement of Red House Run Elementary School. In order to make the most efficient use of this added capacity, Superintendent Dr. Williams approved in September 2022 the initiation of a boundary study for elementary schools in this region. I believe it should be 2021, not 2022. Sorry about that. The boundary study process was facilitated by an independent consultant, Cropper GIS, who made the presentation in one of our last meetings. And the process was managed by the Office of Strategic Planning. Mr. Paul Taylor, who's a member of my team, he has the Office of Str Strategic Planning. So with this, uh, I'll give it to Dr. Zarkin. Thank you. On February 8th, 2022, the Board of Education received for consideration a report from the Northeast Area Elementary School Boundary Study Committee. The committee's recommended boundary changes affect eight existing Northeast Area Elementary Schools. The recommendation, known as Option 2, affects the boundaries of Elmwood, Fullerton, Joppa View, McCormick, Perry Hall, Red House Run, Shady Spring, and Vincent Farm Elementary Schools. A board hearing was held 
on the recommended boundary changes on February 16th, 2022. Feedback was received from two individuals. Communications regarding the process were extensive in multiple language and made through the BCPS website, media advisories, emails, and correspondence from principals. The recommended option was voted on by the committee who engaged in a process of data collection, analysis, and community engagement. Engagement with the public was facilitated through the completion of a survey, the availability of a dedicated boundary study comment form, a public information setting or session, and a board hearing. All the meetings were live streamed and available for viewing throughout the process in several languages. Throughout the months of the study, the committee attended five meetings where they reviewed hundreds of documents, developed and evaluated options, and worked together to build consensus. We thank them for their time, effort, and commitment throughout the process. This concludes our introduction or reintroduction of this submission and requests that the board vote to approve the North Northeast Elementary Boundary Study Recommendation of Option 2. May I have a motion to approve Option 2 of the boundary for the new Northeast Area Elementary School? So moved, Kuhn. A second? Second, Mack. Ms. Mack. Discussion. Any discussion? Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Uh, so prior to today's board meeting, um, I believe it was last week, I, I requested information. Uh, pardon me. Excuse me, Mr. Mercedes. Uh, just a, a point of parliamentary procedure for, for the student member to participate in debate on a motion uh, that needs to be a suspension of the rules, which requires a two-thirds vote of the board. So moved. Second. Do I need a second? Second. second. Mr. Offerman. Mr. Offerman. Any discussion on that? I need the motion. Excuse me? I need you to say the motion. You need motion. to make the motion. Make the motion. So, Ms. Gover, is that my responsibility to make that motion? You need to repeat it. Excuse me? Repeat it. Okay, and who initially said it? Ms. Rowe. Right. So Mr. Bersetti suggested a rule suspension and not allowing the student member of the board to debate on something which he cannot vote on, and I said so moved. So the motion would be to suspend rules, allowing the student member to debate on an item that he cannot vote. Okay. There was second. second. Any further discussion? Ms. Gover, roll call vote. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Thomas, your question, please. Well, first, I'd just like the record to reflect that I am in support of that motion to allow me to participate in this discussion. Thank you. Um, my first question is, so prior to this board meeting and last week, I asked about specific demographics for the affected seven or eight schools um, to kind of get a racial breakdown of what these schools would look like. Um, and it said that it would be presented to us at today's meeting. So is that available? So that report was completed uh, just in the last few days and it will be said to you. Uh, we are working with the superintendent office for you to have that report next week sometime. Okay, so one of the reasons I was asking for that is because I alluded to it earlier in my small report, but I think we can do more to make sure that the demographics in our schools are reflective of the school system as a whole, you know, to have one school closer to the city to have a, a minority rate of 94% and then farther from the city to have it as 54%. I mean, this is one, this is a five mile radius and we can be doing more about that. So I, I would have liked to see that tonight so I can kind of dissect that, look and look more into it and see what that really means, the minority rate. Um, you know, it could be because there's a, a, this is an ESOL school, so we have more ESOL students and they have a predominant uh, race. But, you know, since it isn't available tonight, uh, thank you, and I, I'd like to see it in the future. Ms. Rowe. So, um, just to, I saw that report and I saw what um, Mr. Thomas was asking, and I just wanted to point out that 
while there has been a history in school systems and in our country of attempting to do anything and everything necessary to desegregate a school, I'd like to point out that there are many situations in which the community that other people would like to desegregate may not actually want to be desegregated. So for example, in my district and in the neighborhood I live in, we have Halstead Academy that is compared to Stoneley Elementary, a very similar situation. But the people who live in Hillendale do not want the children moved from Halstead Academy over to Stoneley. And the reason is because there is a PAL Center attached to Halstead Academy, and many of the children will walk to the PAL Center or get out of Halstead Academy and go to the PAL Center. It's after school childcare, it's meals, it's um, supervision while parents are working, and those things do not exist at Stoneley. And crossing Lock Raven Boulevard, even if they did exist at Stoneley, would not be suitable for elementary school students. And so I understand that it's, it's difficult to see as schools that are two schools that are very um, segregated like that. And when I first moved into the area, it was difficult for me to look at. But in talking to the Hillendale community and other communities, and some of these communities are in my district, it is not always the case that the African American communities have an interest in having their children bus to some other location. And I think it's important to respect their wishes on this also. Thank you, Ms. Ruff. Thank you. Ms. Joes. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I heard you say, Dr. Zarchin, that only two individual feedback, you got two people to respond in a school district that's gonna impact thousands of children. Is that correct? No, two at that meeting. Two, just two yes. people at the meeting in, in a, that's gonna impact thousands of children. Yeah. So that tells you all you need to know. And second of all, I do wanna point out that in 1955 when Brown versus Board of Education happened, people were opposed to desegregating our schools. That doesn't mean we don't do the right thing. We should do the right thing. It's hard. You're going to get feedback. But there are also people that when Ruby Bridges went to her school, were opposing her, jeering at her, mocking her, because she was going to a desegregated school. So this board needs to be ashamed to say that we are going to perpetuate that desegregation. And oh, well, that's the easy thing to do. No, we need to do the hard thing. We need to do what's right for all our children. It is appalling to hear that here on this dais. It's one thing to hear that on Facebook. Another thing to hear it here on the Board of Education of the 25th largest school district. Thank you. Any additional questions? Ms. Causey. Thank you. Um, I think it might be helpful to um, review the process where there were members from each school, there were community members that met regularly and provided input. Um, but my specific question relates to the public hearing that was held where there were only two people that uh, commented in that open forum after the recommendation was presented to the board. Uh, we heard a very compelling um, comment by a parent who had a uh, vision impaired spouse and for whom the uh, transition to a different school farther, much farther from their home would be problematic. Was there consideration that was given by staff to that situation? Um, or would the board need to make a motion to put that planning block back? Um, I'm just curious if staff had uh, evaluated that uh, very compelling circumstance. So I'll share some initial comments with you and then maybe uh, Mr. Taylor can add to that. Uh, the issue, number one, the, the entire process is community driven and process is per board policy 1280, and the details of that is included in the rule 1280. So a lot of comments that we have received here that why don't we do this or why don't we do that, that's a separate conversation in our mind. Our task is to make sure that what we do is, in, is consistent and compliance with board policy 1280. 
if the board wants to change that policy in future to include some of the conversation that's taking place here, that's a different matter. That doesn't apply to, to this particular uh, redistricting process. The second piece is that the two comments that we received had to do with uh, two planning blocks. And consultant, as they presented uh, in, in their presentation, looked at that. And the purpose of redistricting is to make sure that the maximum efficiency is achieved in terms of capacity utilization of all the school so that all folks, all children, can get the maximum advantage of the new facilities and capacity relief in the existing facilities. If we make changes based on one or two parents' need, we risk impacting capacity utilization of several schools. There may be other ways of accommodating those parents by use, uh, using the exception process, and Mr. Taylor can talk about some of that. But for uh, a few exceptions, we recommend board consider the entirety of the recommendation by, of an independent consultant. Mr. Taylor, do you want to add anything to what I said? Well, the only thing I would add is that the, um, as far as the process is concerned, all of the comments that we receive from the public is provided to the committee. Uh, the committee is the one that evaluates all the information. Uh, staff guides the process, but we don't um, weigh in on the criteria. They, we let the committee do that. So all the comments that we receive from all public sources was provided to the committee in their deliberations. Um, then the other thing um, you mentioned, Mr. Dixit, was the policy that allows for exceptions. I think it's 5140 um, that allows for consideration of students that um, would be in terminal grades to stay in the school. They can do that by a request. So is that considered special permission transfer, or is is it a different process? I'm pretty sure. I'll look it up, but I'm pretty sure it's a special permission transfer. It is. Okay. So, and, and um, I agree with the concept that we need to make the decisions for the effectiveness of the school system for the whole county for all the students. Um, and I also from several boundary studies that um, I've been engaged with over the years, um, it, would, it would seem that with two people showing up at the public hearing after the full recommendations are being presented uh, means that there's uh, consensus among the community. Because if we've seen boundary studies where when the recommendations are presented, then we receive intensive feedback that the community is not satisfied with that and the board has um, from time to time made adjustments um, based on analyzing the situation. So um, we appreciate the work that was done uh, by the community members to get to that point of consensus. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Ms. Scott. Thank you very much for that. Um, I guess, uh, one, I like to hear um, these conversations. They're robust. I think they need to happen so that we can make sure that um, we're all inclusive in, in what we do. And um, I do uh, thank Mr. Thomas um, for being um, one of the, well, the youngest person on the board, but um, leading us in a way so that we can be holistic in our approach to make sure that our schools are not segregated or at least trying to minimize the impact of segregation in our schools. Um, you know, school segregation in the United States, I was just reading in Wikipedia um, that currently it says more than half of all students in the United States attend school districts with high racial concentrations, um, over 75 percent either white or non-white, and about 40 percent of black students attend schools where 90 to 100 percent of students are non-white. So this leads me to um, believe that Baltimore County is basically a microcosm of what's happening in the larger United States. And I think that we can be robust in our ways that we address this. I think um, some of the things that were spoken about as far as like this school may have this, this school may not have that, I think that leads us to making sure, um, as we just did with the budget, that we have equal resources at all of our schools. Um, it also shows us that we've come far, but we still have so much further to go. So I just think that we need to make sure that we're making sure that our schools are equally resourced. And um, it was mentioned as far as African-American students or parents, and speaking as an African-American parent, 
I want my child to have the best education that's available and that's out there. As far as busing and things like that, I, I think that we need to make sure that all of our schools are well resourced so that we can do that. And I can speak on behalf of African American parents because I am one. So I, I feel that I am a, an authority in that area. Thank you. Ms. Joes. Thank you. I do want to remind also the school system, was this taken to the um, equity office to look through it from an equitable point of view, how we could be more diverse. Um, the school district is 66% children of color. And to see that lack of diversity and to think that just two people showing up is enough, it clearly shows that it's a community that needs more from the powers that be, local government, state government. And it is sad because it's because of the immigration act that happened in 1965 was because of the Civil Rights Act that Dr. Bashford owns sits here, I sit here. It's because of Dr. Martin Luther King and what he did to desegregate and bring civil rights to all of us. So I find it extremely offensive and offensive uh, to hear that we are not going to do enough to desegregate our schools. We should. We must. That's the right thing to do, and I will not be voting on this. Okay. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Uh, when I, again, looking at this the documentation provided. I asked for median incomes um, that were associated, and it said that that could not be provided. One of the reasons I asked for median incomes is because, you know, I'm trying to see why do we have these farm rates, for these projected farms rates for our schools, you know. I'm, I'm trying to, again, dissect the data that we're given and look deeper into the boundary study, um, but I know that they can't be provided. So a concern I have is that we have some schools that are 35% uh, students with free and reduced meals, and then another school, it has 76% of students. And so I'm like, well, what are the families? Uh, how are they going to be, be, be able to provide to PTAs? How engaged are the parents going to be if they're working two jobs, three jobs in this community? And the, uh, the entire community is like that when we have some schools where only a small fraction of the community has parents that are, would have to work twice as hard in order to provide for their students. So, uh, you know, I, what I, I, anyways, coming to the question that I wanted to ask you all was, how were the individuals selected to serve on this committee for the new Northeast Elementary School Boundary Study? How did we select the, you know, the two representatives from each school, from parents and, and all those things? Paul. The uh, principals of each school um, poll their community. They ask for volunteers. Um, they submit those names to the executive directors that they report to. And those executive directors then make the recommendation to the superintendent who approves the final list. Okay, and did this committee have any public hearings themselves to hear from other individuals that weren't the individuals on the committee? Yeah, there's a public information session that was held where the public was allowed to um, weigh in on their opinion of all the different options, and the committee listened to that and also took in, uh, there was a survey that was done after the public information session, and the results of those surveys was provided to the committee. Thank you. Dr. Hager, do you have a question? Um, I do not. I, I had to step away briefly, which is uh, what I was telling Tracy in the chat, but um, but I do share the concerns um, when looking at the documents that others have about the uh, continuation of the the segregation by school and the, and the different options that were provided, that there wasn't much of a dramatic change. That's all. Thank you. There's a motion on the floor to approve option two of the boundary for the new Northeast Area Elementary School. Ms. Gover, can we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jost? Abstain. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Abstain. Dr. Hager? Abstain. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Favor is six. So the motion carries. Oh, great. Oh, it's because I can't vote. <laughs> yes, she can't vote. Correct. So the motion carries. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I'd like the record to reflect that I would be voting no on this if the student member was able to vote. And my reason for that is, you know, we need to change our practices here in BCPS. I had a great conversation with Cropper about the ways that we can make, make ensuring that our schools have. Demographics that are reflective of our, our school community a priority 
and it was just thrown into the mix with all of the other priorities. So I really think we need to analyze how we are reviewing our boundaries. We need to look at all of our schools again and how the boundaries were scheduled. And I, I, I would like us. I don't like the front and the back of that. Oh, sorry. I, and I, I just really think that we could be doing more as a school system. So thank you. And I would vote no on this if I was given the opportunity. Dr. Williams. So I want to remind the board that something that was very important that Mr. Dixit said. May I finish, please? Mr. Oh, Dixit I was said, board, you need to look at your policy, which we will then look at our rule. So it's just not the northeast area. I was just visiting a school this morning, 3% African American. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to do the work, then you have to look at the policy regarding a boundary study. If you really want to do that work to make sure we have diversity in each one of our schools, that's your work. This committee, this team followed the board policy and rule. First, I want to thank those principals, the nominated folks. I want to thank the committee that worked tirelessly on this because the, the other piece you need to understand with boundaries, there are staffing implications. And this is staffing season. So our principals, I'm sure, are watching at this time saying, I need the vote so I know how many staff members I may be losing because of the number of staff. But if you really want to do the work, it is, it is the system, the system of schools that you probably should look at the policy to think about a boundary study. But, but I've been through that in my other life. And that's not easy work because you're talking about populations. Mr. Thomas, we have a system that is made up of a suburban, urban, and rural configuration. In reality, it would be great to have diversity of students, great to have diversity of staff. That's our work, but we're following the policy as written. But I do want to commend the committee that worked tirelessly on this to make a recommendation I want to thank these gentlemen for presenting and for answering your questions this evening. And I do see Mr. Principal Jennings out here who's waiting to know what will be the new name of that school. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. The next item on the agenda is consideration of the name of the new Northeast Area Elementary School. And for that, I call on Dr. Zarshan. Good evening. Now I have the pleasure of bringing forward for your consideration the name Rossville Elementary School for the new Northeast Area Elementary School. May I have a motion to approve the name of Rossville Elementary School for the new Northeast Area Elementary School? So moved, Roe. Ms. Roe, second? second Ms. Mack. Mack was a second. Any discussion? Ms. Joes. Real quick, I looked at the statistics and it looked like you were just off by two votes between Gum Spring Elementary School. Oswell Elementary, and uh, I would also like to know what Principal Jenkins is <laughs> going to vote for. <laughs> Jennings, sorry. What would be his vote? Okay, all right, thank you. Any further discussion? Ms. Go yes, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Just that um, in, in preparing for this, this naming tonight, um, I'm, I'm going to respect the, the decision of the vote. I 100% I believe that it should be called Vossville, but I, I was considering on the possibility of recognizing some of the trees that were cut down uh, in creating this bill, as Dr. Farone had mentioned in his testimony. I was trying to think of some creative names like Arbor Elementary School or, I don't know, like Rossville Arbor Elementary School, something. But, uh, you know, I, I want us to continue to ponder environmental sustainability in our natural environments with future school construction. So I just wanted to state that. Thank you. There's a motion on the floor to approve the name of Rossville Elementary School for the new Northeast Area Elementary School. Ms. Gover, a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. The new item on the agenda is a report of the Maryland Early Fall Assessment Results, and for that I'll call on Dr. McComas and Mr. Conley.
So good evening, Dr. Williams. Yes, so good evening, Vice Chair McMillian and members of the board and the BCPS community. This evening, we will provide an overview of the early fall assessment results. There seems to be some confusion about them, so I'm so glad that the, our team here is to provide some clarity about what the fall assessments are and are not. The intention is to share the reading and math data for students as we fully engage in face-to-face -face learning. Families who elected to participate in our virtual learning program were provided with the opportunity to participate in the early fall assessments. Students who participated in the assessments will receive a home report from MSDE, the Maryland State Department of Education, detailing their performance level in reading and mathematics. The early fall assessments are one data point that will be used in conjunction with other assessments of academic growth and achievement to provide us with important insight into the current levels of student performance and acceleration needed for students to demonstrate skills which meet or exceed the expectations of college and career readiness grade level standards. Dr. McComas. Yes, thank you, Dr. Williams, and good evening. Um, I'm joined this evening by Mr. Conley. He's our Executive Director of um, Research and Accountability. Um, next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, you're on the right slide. Um, the Compass Air Pathway to Excellence provides us a system-wide focus on raising the bar, closing gaps, and preparing our students for their future. Our dedication to ensuring that our students do graduate college and career ready is a thoughtful and research-based approach to understanding key metrics of student progress. We utilize MCAP data in reading and mathematics as just one measure of our student achievement and growth along that college and career uh, trajectory. As we collaboratively developed the Compass, research showed us that students who scored at or above 61st percentile on measures of academic performance or MAP assessments were more likely to score proficiency levels on uh, proficiency level of four or five on the corresponding Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program in ELA and mathematics. This is just one example of how our Compass intentionally raises the bar for all of our students to promote college and career readiness. Next slide, please. It's important as we move forward this evening to understand that we triangulate data to support learning. This fall, we did engage in multiple measures to assess our student performance and their readiness for grade level learning, um, one of which was through our measures of academic performance, um, or MAP. Another is through the MSDE early fall assessments, which we will be focusing on this evening. And of course, everyday student work samples. This evening, as mentioned, we will focus specifically on the Maryland um, State Department of Education's early fall assessments that were given this year in complement to the previous presentation we provided on MAP. During the onset and continuation of COVID-19 pandemic, schools across the state focused on student learning and social emotional well-being. And state assessments did not occur for 18 months that being March 2020 until just this past fall of 2021. Testing did, as you know, resume this fall with the administration of these early fall assessments, and they did include assessments in English language arts, mathematics, and science, uh, often referred to as Air Maryland Integrated Science Assessment, or MISA. The MSDE early fall assessments should be viewed differently than the traditionally given MCAP assessments as they are shortened versions of previous tests given under the Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program. Uh, Mr. Conley will share more details with you around the difference between these early fall assessments and our traditional assessments uh, further in our presentation. On the screen before you, what you see is just a quick recap of our MAP assessments that we provided a presentation to you previously. We know that the Maryland fall uh, assessments are only one data point and that multiple points are used to measure student growth and achievement along their trajectory. Um, for example, the data on the slide before you was shared at our January 25th meeting, and the results indicate that most of our elementary students and some of our middle school students outperformed their 2019 peer groups for the percent of students achieving at or above the 21st percentile. The graphs illustrate student progress towards our 2024-2025 school year target of having 50% of students achieving high or above average. Coming soon, the quarterly results will report will also provide additional insight into students' course grades and performance. The use of these multiple measures or data points for our student performance 
um, includes MAP, uh, unit assessments, SAT, PSAT, cre teacher create um, assignments and assessments, as well as the state assessments that we're looking at this evening. At this point, I will turn it over to my colleague, Mr. Conley, who will begin uh, sharing with you the differences between our early fall assessments and the traditional MCAP. Thank you, Dr. McComas. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, under the Every Student Suc Succeeds Act, or ESSA, MSDE was required to give the early fall assessments this year to students who participated in courses assessed by MCAP during the 2020-2021 school year after a request for waiver for the spring 2021 testing was denied by the U.S. Department of Education. There are a few important aspects to note regarding the uh, MSDE early fall assessment. The items used for the early fall assessment were for standard setting purposes for the upcoming spring 2022 MCAP ELA, Math, and Maryland Integrated Science or MISA assessments. These assessments differed greatly in the amount of time and items used per assessment. This chart illustrates the difference in the MSDE early fall assessment and historical MCAP assessments for ELA and Math. Early fall assessments testing time and number of test items were 50% or less than the time and test items used for historical MCAP assessments. In addition to less testing time and test items, the early fall assessments used selected response items only compared to traditional MCAP assessments, which include selected response, technology enhanced constructed response, and those written constructed response items. The early fall assessment further reported three performance levels compared to previous MCAP assessments, which reported five proficiency levels for ELA and math. The result was that students who did not meet or exceed standards were identified as approaching expectations, regardless of how many items they got correct. Next slide, please. Thank you. In order to meet the federal ESSA reporting requirements, once again, MSD administered the early fall assessments to students this fall. The early fall assessment results for BCPS are similar to the results reported across Maryland. Student performance may be displayed by proficiency level or by percentage of points earned. Due to the substantial decrease in the number of test items for the MSDE early fall assessment, coupled with the change in performance levels, all resulted in a greater range of possible student performance within the approaching proficiency level, since any student not meeting or exceeding standards, regardless of how many points they got correct, were identified as approaching expectations. As shown on the next slides, the percentage of points earned out of possible points provides us with greater insight into student performance. Next slide, please. Thank you. Compared to the MCAP, ELA, and Math Spring assessments, the number of possible points that students could earn for the early fall assessments for ELA and Math were greatly reduced and the test items used did not include constructed response items. Assessment results displayed are reported based on the percentage of points earned on each assessment. The number of points available was dependent on what form of the test a student took. On both the ELA and math test, elementary students perform similar to all students across Maryland. Comparing the early fall assessment results with our upcoming MCAP spring results may provide VCPS with insight into the impact of system-wide initiatives on continued student growth, growth such as open court, number quarter, and bridges, which are designed to accelerate student learning at the elementary level while building foundational skills, critical thinking, and fluency. Next slide, please. Thank you. The early fall assessment results for middle school students show BCPS students perform similar to students across the state, scoring within two to five percentage points of the state average. However, it is important to note that there were only 16 possible points earned on the math test. We have focused on middle school mathematics this school year and will provide full implementation of illustrative math for next school year. Comparing the results of the early fall assessment with the upcoming MCAP spring results may provide BCPS with insight into the growth of students due to middle school initiatives such as disciplinary literacy, rigorous and relevant first instruction, targeted professional development, and programs and support such as illustrative math, elevation, and AVID. Next slide, please. 
Students taking the early fall assessment to fulfill high school graduation requirements were administered once again a shortened version of the graduation test. Students were not required to pass the early fall assessment high school test in order to meet their graduation requirement, as participating in the test fulfilled the state requirement for graduation. Students who completed English 10 during the 2020-2021 school year participated in the early fall assessment. On average, these students earned 53% of the possible points, two percentage points higher than the state average. Students in middle school were required to take the assessment that matched the math course they took in the 2021 school year. Algebra 1 results are based on middle school and high school students who passed Algebra 1 for the first time in the 2021 school year. The, uh, the geometry and Algebra 2 results are based on the 2021 middle school students who took those courses last year since those assessments are not given in high school. Middle school students participating in the Algebra 2 assessment who are twice accelerated in the mathematics coursework outperform the state average by 16 percentage points. High schools focusing on providing students with opportunities to increase participation are having success in advanced academics, college and career pathways to accelerate student learning, including programs such as AP, IB, dual enrollment, early college access, and CTE programs. Next slide, please. Thank you. Under the ESSA Act, the MSDE was required to give the early fall assessments for students who participated in grades five and eight science in the 2021 school year after a request for that waiver was also denied. The MSDE early fall assessment items were used for standard setting for the upcoming spring 2022 MCAP MISA assessments. The MSDE early fall assessments for science, or MISA, greatly differed in the amount of time and items used per assessment, such, just as like the ELA and math assessments for early fall. This chart illustrates the difference in the MSDE early fall assessment and historical MCAP assessments for MISA. As noted, the duration of the MSDE early fall assessments and the number of test items once again were 50% or less than the time and test items used for the historical uh, MCAP assessments. In addition to less time and less tested items, the early fall assessments were selected response items only compared to traditional MCAP assessments which include selected response, technology enhanced responses, and constructed response items. The early fall assessments reported three performance levels compared to previous reporting of four performance levels. This resulted, uh, this resulted in students who did not meet standards as being identified as approaching regardless of how many items they scored correct. Next slide, please. The early fall assessments for grades five and eight MISA results by average points and by performance level shows that BCPS students performed similar to the average performance of students across the state. Rigorous science instruction across grade levels provides students with opportunities to build upon their scientific foundational knowledge and understanding through exploration, hands-on learning, safety, and outdoor learning. Elementary school science curriculum is aligned with the next generation science standards. For each unit, students learn about scientific phenomena while solving real world and local problems. Middle school science units begin with a problem or a scenario which establishes a purpose for problem solving while integrating science concepts which deepen students' knowledge, curiosity, and critical thinking. High school students extend and apply their scientific knowledge and understanding through an inquiry and project-based learning approach. Next slide, please. BCPS students participate in MCAP assessments throughout any given school year. Kindergarten students participate in, in the KRA or Kindergarten Readiness Assessment in the fall. High school students who need to meet assessment requirement for graduation participate in fall block and winter block assessments. English language learners participate in Access for L's in the winter. And students in grades three through eight participate in ELA, math, and science assessments beginning in the spring. Additionally, students in grade eight take a social studies assessment in the spring. Middle school students in advanced mathematics um, take course specific MCAP assessments for algebra one, geometry, or algebra two. And high school students take the graduation requirement test for ELA 10, algebra one, life sciences, or AP biology. 
Our schools across all grade levels are providing students with rigorous and relevant standards-based instruction to prepare students to meet or exceed grade level expectations. We look forward to reporting the results of state and local assessments with the Board of Education and our community and how curriculum, teaching, and learning are promoting student growth and achievement. Next, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Mary boswell Bacobas. Thank you. If you could go to the next two slides. Uh, what you see on this slide and the one right after it is our ongoing schedule of future academic achievement reports. Um, and at that, we'd like to conclude this presentation. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Thank you. Any questions? There's no, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> I think we've got one. Ms. Mack. Yes, um, good evening, um, Mr. Connolly and Dr. Boswell McComas. Um, I have one question about MAP and two questions about MCAP. For the abbreviated MCAP, what is the correlation between percentage of points earned and proficiency? I ask this because slide nine shows percentage of points earned, which slide six indicates was an option <coughs> for this abbreviated version of MCAP. But I, I am concerned that the information as shown on slide nine could be misconstrued because pre-pandemic, um, BCPS's 2019 ELA 10 proficiency was 33.6, and our algebra one proficiency was 17% which are vastly different than what is shown on slide nine. So I'll get started, Ms. Mack, and, um, and then I'll have Mr. Connolly join. So first, I think it's important to recognize that the instruments that were used prior to the pandemic are a different instrument. The state was in the process. Um, regardless of the pandemic, of shifting the actual instrument they use to assess the standards. So I think that's important to recognize. Um, and uh, second, I'm going to hand the, the, the points correlation question over to Mr. Conley, as that's his area of expertise. Sure, thank you. So um, back in the spring MCAP of 2020, a few LEAs had already started participating before um, the COVID-19 global pandemic had hit. So they had a few thousand responses to determine some of the standard setting for items. The state of Maryland did not have enough information to create the next um, adapted spring MCAP assessment based on the small sample size. So they did put in a waiver for uh, the next school year because they didn't have an assessment that was ready. And while that waiver was denied, we came back in the fall to gather the information needed in order to have an assessment that we could put forward in the spring that may be comparable to previous spring assessments. But the early fall assessment, given how the test was given uh, for the number of items, the time that was used, and the types of questions that were asked which were selected response only, makes it a very different test than what we traditionally consider as MCAP assessments. Um, the amount of time and effort that's put into standard setting for those MCAP assessments are extensive. Um, the Maryland early fall assessments were intended to provide additional information to improve the quality of those spring assessments. Um, one of the things that does stand out is that different forms for ELA had a different number of items possible, somewhere between 32 and 38. So while one student may have gotten, let's say, 24 out of 38, another student may have gotten 24 out of 32. You would look and say 24 is 24, but the denominator is different, so the percent correct is different. So that person that was 24 out of 32 would have a higher percent correct than the person that was 24 out of 38, and that may lead to a different proficiency level. So that's some of the uh, concerns and questions that we had when we're looking at and interpreting the early fall, um, MSDE early fall assessments. Um, thank you for that. And, and I do understand that it's a different test and a different assessment, but I am concerned that anybody looking at slide nine, briefly looking at it, mm -hmm. would potentially think that we have a 58% proficiency in algebra two, when in fact the highest it's ever been in the last five years was 24.4, and that was in 2016. Um, so I, I do understand it's a new test. I do understand that we um, are coming off two years of a pandemic, but I just wanted to point that out. So my question about M, about MAP is, during the January 25th presentation on MAP, we were informed that in the fall 2021 administration of MAP was the first time that second graders mm -hmm. um, without a specific accommodation 
were not allowed to have a reader based on an M M W E A research that indicated we needed to have um, a different scale to properly show growth. And I asked the question to ensure a valid comparison between winter and fall and winter growth, was the MAP test for winter and spring going to be administered exactly the same way? And I have um, been hearing from teachers over the last couple weeks that second graders are without accommodation are allowing readers. Can you um, explain that, please? Yeah. So, so first and foremost, there's a misconception that you're that you're sharing, and I just want to bring light to that. This is not an accommodation, and it's not a reader. The program for MAP, the K to two version of MAP, reads to students. The program does that. It's not a reader. It's not an accommodation. It's not a modification. It's a part of the testing environment. What MS, uh, I'm sorry, what NWEA came back and said was when we read to all second graders in the fall, we're actually skewing our own growth data because students along a continuum, we expect them to learn and grow across second grade. And second grade is that transition of learning to read to reading to learn that we would expect to see in the beginning of third grade. And that's a research-based component of development. We know that all kids develop in different ways. They all have different strengths. But the, the reality is that the test change was based on being able to get more valid growth about student learning, not to skew any type of experience like that. What we have shared with folks is that for students who score below a certain RIT score, they're not demonstrating the independent skills uh, to be able to read the test as a reading comprehension test. So they're having more opportunities to move back into a K-2 environment. Initially, we predicted for the MAP testing. Additionally, we predicted about 14% of our kids would actually be better served by a K-2 assessment, while 86% of our kids would be better served by the two to five assessment. We did not have baseline data in order to go through and make um, that, that decision across the board for all grade two students. So we need to develop baseline data. And our baseline data is holding true to that and we'll have better growth data to inform instruction as a direct result of that. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn. Oh, thank you. And just to follow up uh, from uh, Ms. Mack's questions, because she really highlighted slide nine, and now it has me um, questioning what I'm looking at. You said, you made, you made the mention that if there were 38 questions in one test and 32, and they both got 24, that, that it would look like they got the same number of questions right, which is accurate, but if we just made those percentages, wouldn't we get an accurate feel for, yeah, for how they did? And that's what we're doing. It's not going by the number of items scored correct. And this slide that Ms. Mack referenced is actually the percentage of points earned. So for this slide, when you look at math, where we referenced the 58%, mm -hmm. that's actually out of 16 questions. So that means we, we averaged eight point something items correct when you percentage it up to 58%. So it's not 58% proficient. It's the percent of points based on the denominator of points possible. So it's out of 16 points. Uh, okay, it's the point being it's very challenging to understand that from what's being presented here. Um, so I, I know this is, there's a lot of different assessments and there seems to be transition from one to the other and we have COVID on top of everything. Mm -hmm. Um, I but, would agree with that. Right, right. With that. <laughs> and and you guys, that. you're living in the data, so we appreciate your insight. Um, so based on all of this, can you tell us that we're, because I look at this and it looks like we're, we've made progress in Algebra 2. Are we making progress in Algebra 2 or are we staying the same or I can't, I can't tell. So to go back to the very beginning, mm -hmm. um, you know, Dr. Boswell McComas had mentioned that we use multiple data points. Right. And the early fall assessment was an opportunity um, to get one set of data. It's not comparable in comparison to MCAP that we have previously. So to try to make comparisons, you know, doesn't work. They change the proficiency levels, they change the, the points possible and the test items. But when we look at Algebra 1 in conjunction with curriculum-based assessments and we look at how our students are doing on, on fall MAP, you know, each of these pieces gives us an entry point. And so what I'm most excited about is not what we found out for baseline, but what we're going to find out mid-year to see how much growth our students have experienced because of what's happening in each classroom and each school and the work of central office to support that work. 
It's coming. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Mrs. Causey. Thank you very much. Um, in terms of the, uh, presenting the data and understanding progress, uh, we um, do not have as a goal to be average. We have a goal to be the highest. So I think it would be helpful to add in uh, future reports or even update this one as to what are the metrics of the most successful district in Maryland uh, with where we are and where we want to go, right? Um, second is uh, the content that was tested. Is it last year's content? That was That's tested correct. It's for students who were um, completing those courses in the previous year. Okay. And were they given any opportunity to review in the fall? That was not, um, unless a course had some natural overlap, like ELA or math, then they may have opportunities built into our curriculum where we revisit the previous skills. But if a student is moving from AP biology to AP chemistry, they're not getting biology instruction prior to this assessment. Okay, thank you. Um, and is there any indication that MSDE will continue to use the assessments as they are on an ongoing basis? Uh, MSD has not indicated that this will be uh, going forward as an early fall assessment at this comprehensive of a level. Okay. And then with the numbers that are showing up, what is the struggle that, that the students are having in the middle school math? And what are the strategies um, that are being looked into? We understand that early on the elementary school level, we change the math curriculum after the evaluation, and so that should really um, make a big difference. But what are we going to do for these students now that need, need math and they need to progress? Sure, I think that's where I enter the conversation, so thank you. Um, as you know, I think there's a multiple uh, layers of strategies here, Ms. Causey, to address the instructional needs of our middle school students. And uh, thank you for pointing out, we have been in this ongoing transition around our math curriculum, as you've stated. Um, and we, you know, when we look at the math data in particular, we're beginning to see the impact of that, right? Um, and of course, that will also matriculate to our middle school. But what we're doing right now for this year's middle school students is one, we are in a process of field testing illustrative math at the secondary level, right? So we're in those very, very early stages of implementing a new curriculum. In addition, we have really uh, followed the research um, and um, anchored our work in learning acceleration. And what that really means, and we did a presentation way back at the beginning of the school year and curriculum committee, so feel free for your viewing pleasure to go back and um, look at that. But fundamentally, what the research says is that when students have had significant interruption to learning, and this research really grows out of school systems that have experienced natural disasters, such as Katrina in the New Orleans school system, is that... <clears throat> Pardon me. You have to really focus on those key anchor standards, right? Because there are some, um, forgive the layman's term, power standards, if you will, right? That are these enduring standards. And other standards then um, hang off of those power standards. You focus on those, and then you identify what are those gaps that students may have um, that they, they didn't have because things were interrupted or moved at a different pace, right? Um, and then you target those in real time as you're making progress along the, the, the grade level level standards. What's really important is that you are exposing students to the grade level standards. So when we talk about math, um, we're really layering those two strategies together, the learning acceleration along with layering in a, a new evidence-based curriculum in, in illustrative math. So that's what we're doing right now. <laughs> so thank you. Well, thank you. And I think that what um, people don't see is the, the background. Years and years ago, shifts were made, decisions made. Yeah didn't work out, but we are trying to, as a board, as superintendent of the school system, we are trying to make corrections and adjustments and huge shifts where needed to help our children. So pre I really appreciate that. Thank you. Dr. Hager. Sorry, I was uh, had, had a different screen up. Um, Thank you uh, for the great presentation. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person to see your faces. Um, but I had two quick questions. Um, I was trying to flip back and forth on the slides, so um, I just want to make sure that this is correct. We, we So as a researcher who, who does um, this type of work, we're looking at the standardized test scores. I have been frustrated over the years about them changing the standardized test so many times. I'm sure that you feel the same way. Um, and so it sounds like they changed the MCAP for the fall administration, and they're changing it again for the spring administration so that it's not going to be the same as prior MCAP tests. Is that correct? 
<clears throat> so what MSD has shared with us that, yes, um, they are making changes to the spring 2022 MCAP assessments. They have told us um, that they believe that there will be alignment, and that is what their psychometricians are working towards, that we'll be able to compare. But there's multiple changes. Uh, the items are changing. Uh, for the platform, they're moving towards a adaptive platform, so it'll look more like map testing rather than um, students uh, getting the same bank of questions. And then the third piece is changing proficiency levels from five levels to four. So there are a lot of, in a lot of ways, Dr. Hager, this is like another repeat of a whole new beginning. And oh you know, while we can look for some um, research-based alignment from MSDE, they're changing multiple points of the assessment. And so we, uh, we haven't seen those items, we haven't seen the research, and it hasn't been shared with us. It's not public at this point. Wow, so it'll be the sixth test, I think, in, um, in eight years, maybe, or something like that. So, wow, thank you. Um, it must be very challenging. It makes, and, and again, we talked before about how um, the MAP test is, it provides such different information. And so I'm glad that we rely on the MAP test in so many ways. Um, and my other quick question is about the MAP test, just following up on some things that Ms. Mack said. Um, and I, again, I apologize if I, I got lost in the conversation, but d is the second grade administration for winter the same then as the fall? Is it, there were no differences? So um, to go back to the first part of your question, you know, the one thing that MSDE has shared is that the standards haven't changed. So the college and career ready standards are the college and career ready standards. To address the question you just asked when it comes to MAP, we need a baseline data from our second grade students in order to know which assessment was best for them. Previously from the spring of 2019, looking at first grade spring assessments, we saw that 86% of our students were ready for the MAP two to five beginning second grade. We did not have that baseline data during COVID because we did not give MAP testing. Does that clarify? So then from fall to winter, what we've determined is that if a student is at or below the recommended RIT score of 170, that, that we've been training our schools and SDTs to move that student back into the K-2 MAP assessment so that we can better get a, an understanding of all the components that are assessed through MAP. And that is a, a, a standardized practice through NWEA. Ideally, the spring assessment for grade one will inform us about which students in grade two should take which assessment. Got it. Um, so would, the, would a parent get that information on their map printout that, that the, the test was administered differently, or would it just look as if they made a stark improvement? Yeah. So th what a parent sees on their map um, report is the test that the student took, so K to two, two to five, or six through 12, um, they'll see the content area, ELA or math, and then they'll see the sub content areas, such as um, informational text, literary text, vocabulary use, um, problem solving for mathematics, those types of things. You know, the RIT score is <clears throat> the standardized score that is used for all of the other interpretations. So 170 RIT is a 170 RIT, regardless of what grade level you're in or which assessment you take. And so that's the difference with map testing than comparing MCAP, which each assessment and each grade level is its own entity. M uh, MAP is scored across every student as a RIT score calculation based on how they were able to perform. So really, that's a fundamental difference in a norm reference versus a criterion reference assessment. Yeah, no, I, I know that I was just making, I was just wondering how, the, how a parent might interpret it. So, um, no, so thank you. I can talk told, to you about this. Also. Um, the level of performance of a student in five different bands, um, and the, that performance is then broken down into each of the four or five subcontent standards, depending on whether it's ELA or math. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Joes. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. McComas, for this presentation. So my question is, I'm looking at how we went from five performance levels to three, and when we got the scores as parents, you had three levels approaching, meeting, and exceeding. How could a parent tell if, if it was approaching and they were at the lower end of the spectrum, say zero, and do we, have we caught that data of how many kids are actually at the lower end of approaching zero to 10 or 30, how they broke it down? So again, I'm gonna ask Mr. Conley, uh, because they're the ones who process all of that data file as it comes in. So the challenge that we have is that with a limited test item pool, 
MSDE couldn't match what we're used to getting previously. So they could only do three proficiency levels, uh, which is the minimum requirement from ESSA from the federal government. They actually requested to go down to two proficiency levels, met or not met, because they knew they had a small sample size of test items. That was also denied by the U.S. Department of Education. So they, so they did the, the standard minimum of three proficiency levels. We do not have a way of informing parents, you know, um, where a child sits across those, that approaching level, which is what we had shared as a concern throughout this presentation, that approaching now becomes this really big bucket. And so at the individual student level, we can look at percent correct compared to the number of items that they've done to kind of get an idea of where a student sits. But I think that that's too much interpretation for such a limited test. So if you were to look at where it um, comes to approaching, there's a little arrow that would show up at the bottom end and then one that would be meeting more towards meeting expectations. Is there any way for us to capture that data to see the kids that are truly failing? And while I agree after the pandemic, standardized testing is not equitable um, and our children are recovering, but is there a way for us to catch that data? And do we have a breakdown on how our more socioeconomically challenged children did? So those are great questions. And if it was a better testing instrument, I'll be honest with you, I would say we have to have that information. But what we have instead are multiple data points. And we have to look at our students by what they're being taught and how they're demonstrating that understanding from the fall to where they're at now based on you know, what's happening in classrooms, what's happening in curriculum-based assessments. You have MAP and the MSDE early fall assessment were just a baseline. Like KRA, it's an entry point. But it doesn't give you an indication moving forward that there's enough comprehensive data to really make instructional decisions. Based on that, you have to dig deeper. And I applaud our teachers and our school administrators and our central office support team for digging deeper. We have to go beyond that level. I think one, and this just one of the things I'd like to offer um, that's really critical for our, our classroom teachers, and they have been actively engaged, is those um, performance assessment task at the beginning of each unit, right? Because those, that's really where you get to, as a teacher, teachers aren't really looking at this. They're going to be looking at the student work in front of them. They're going to see exactly where each student is performing against those standards. And that's where it's really important for our teachers to understand how to accelerate that learning based on those key, those fundamental skills and not uh, content knowledge skills that, that move us through the grade level. So I just want to offer that is that the daily practice of classroom teachers is really anchored very much in student work because that's the most immediate data, that's the most immediate evidence of where our students can demonstrate what they know and can do versus what they're, they're struggling to do. So I just offer that in complement to the state data. Thank you. And that's what I was driving at, that the teachers would know. So a student could do well and, and learn his, his or her data, but would be differently able and would not be able to take a standardized testing as well or proficiently. Uh, so that doesn't necessarily mean they're not learning. And is there a way for us to capture that in a more granular way from schools and get from the teachers because they truly know how their children are doing? more than a standardized testing. Yeah, so, as a former so, principal, so that's let me, let me respond oh, sure. to that. That's the important. I love this conversation because we have <laughs> conversations about da data chats. That's what exactly happens in our school buildings yep. with the teachers and the leadership of their building to look at the data, to make informed decision. A month ago, we had the principal Owings Mills here, and he talked about what happens in the school building. So I just want to I want to say kudos because these are the conversations we have at cabinet. These are the conversations, pardon me, we have at our school base. But I want to go back to the presentation, just remind the board and the public. This is new. It's called the early fall assessment. There's a lot of questions about it. So if you go back to slide five, I really want you to, your homework tonight is to go back to slide five, Mr. Thomas and look at the difference between the early fall assessment and the MCAT. If you continue to compare the results, I think Dr. Hager said it, Mr. Connolly said it, you're comparing to apples and oranges. The assessment change. We're still in a pandemic. We're trying to assess, because you remember a year ago, this board talked about learning loss. 
and we came to you and said, well, look how our students are doing or have done on our MCAP, on our, on, I'm sorry, on our MAP, on our fall assessment. I do want us to go back to slide nine since there were some comments about slide nine. Again, it's a baseline data source about how our students are doing. It's one data point, folks. Dr. McComas said, constantly looking at multiple data, getting to your point. What is the classroom teacher saying about the student? What are those informants decisions that are being made in the classroom at the school level in terms of uh, acceleration, in terms of remediation, in terms of intervention? So it's all of this. This is to show just where we look, what we look like, but I want to echo what Mr. Connolly said. When you look at the scores, that band is not helpful data for that classroom teacher because the form is different and the results are different. So I would just say, go back to slide five, go back to slide nine to really understand the differences. And that at the very end, Mr. Connolly talked about what we think the new MCAP will look like coming up in the spring. But I will say the work that our parents, our teachers and our students did to really prepare our students over the last two years and looking at the standards and trying to accelerate and fill in gaps. That's hard work. We've changed our curriculum. We're looking at our own assessments. And so this is again a glimpse as to what's happening in our school system. And so we'll have some more data points. Again, this is our work this year of providing these multiple academic achievement reports. But I, I just want to reference, there's a lot of questions about these fall assessments statewide. Go to the state board meetings. You can listen, read the articles. This is to give a glimpse as to how we're doing because a year ago, this board talked about the learning loss. Now we know what our students know, what they need assistance in, and how we can provide the support when we bring in our principals to have these data chats. So again, I love the fact we're making you all little data chat groups. <laughs> I appreciate that. But I will caution you, when you compare every year, you're going to get a false report because it's different assessments. When we start looking at 2016 data, 2017 data, and all that's transpired between that year and now, it's a lot. And I have to commend our students who are really working hard, really working hard. I've been in classes. I've been in schools. I see the students working hard as well as the staff. And I have to thank our parents for, for filling in all last year when we were looking at the pandemic and virtual and hybrid. So I just have to say that because we're spending a lot of time on the fall assessments is one data point. And you all could sit and take, maybe you all should take the test. Stop. I think that would be a good challenge that if you not sat, I'm serious, if you have, I took the, the map. If you haven't sat and taken it, you don't understand. You really don't understand as a student and how that feels. So maybe I'll add that to the list, Ms. Gover, and offer that to board members, really so you have an understanding of what these assessments look like. Thank I you, saw Ms. Rowe's hand first. <coughs> so... I have, I, this is where I struggle with all of this. I have sat and listened to these board meetings since my daughter entered kindergarten and she's a sophomore in high school. I've heard this exact presentation multiple times and the basic format of the presentation sounds something like, oh, but look at these map scores. Kids grew from point A to point B. But don't look at these MCAP scores because the state changed something about the test and we really don't know this and that it's literally the exact same explanation. So my question is, if we have no confidence in the state's testing scores from one year to the next or from two years to this third year or whatever as a way to track data, mm -hmm. then why are we not using some other system within our school system so that we have MAP to test growth? but what are we using to test if the child meets the standard? So is a child reading on a third grade level <coughs> on third grade? Because I don't see that the state assessment is doing that. 
at least not according to the presentations given by central offices for the last 12 years. So if this is what our school system is saying, is that the state test is not a reliable system to determine where students are, Khan Academy is reliable. There's other tests out there that are reliable. We could create our own reliable test to test all students. So I just, I have a hard time with the idea that, and if we're not doing that, then maybe the state testing is reliable because so I, I'm very confused by a lot of this because, th and then we have a number of students who couldn't even take the tests because they had computer problems in the middle of the test. I have one child who has no data for MAP or MCAP or fall. So, you know, Thank I'm you, struggling Rowe. with this. Thank you. So I would offer that um, there may need to be a session about for board members to understand, the, to understand assessments and multiple assessments and how we use multiple data. So I can't speak to what happened in 2016, 17, and I would probably argue these pre presentations are different than the previous one. So I will argue that any day, any day. Um, because how we look at data. So I, I will question that, Ms. Rowe. But I will say that if you rely on one assessment, is that an accurate way of saying what students know and should be able to do? My belief is it's not accurate. It's not accurate. And the overarching issue that was happening is we're still in a pandemic. So there is still trauma that our students are dealing with as well as our staff. And what we have always painted to this board is multiple data points. And there's a slide that we did not include, probably should include it, that had all the multiple assessments that we look and that the schools used to make informed decision. So we have to abide by what the state is asking us to do. We provide the assessment, we get the results. We say to our parents, is one data point. We also want to look at what's happening in that classroom. The teachers provide assessments. I think we, we, we also have to fall back on the profession of our teachers who are making good decisions and who have been trained to assess how our students are doing. And then the other issue, Mr. Conley, is always the availability of these test data, right? So when we, in, in years past, the assessment data from the state will not arrive until the fall or sometimes winter, just depends on what's happening. How is the school able to, I think what this is seen, telling me, maybe we need to do some small groups with board to understand about assessments. Because I will question that I think these presentations provide a better idea and the continuity of what we do based on the board goals to give you a, big, a bigger picture of how students are really uh, doing and give you the bigger picture that it's just not one data, uh, one data point. I think it's unfair to assess based on one data point. That's the work of our schools. That's the work of our leaders. That's the work of our teachers. So I just, I would just offer that I think the team has uh, finished the presentation, but it feels like we have to clear, we have to clarify information about assessments, the totality. And I would also offer, please read the executive summary that's attached to this presentation. Ms. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can I ask when this document was attached to board docs for board members' review? Which document are you asking? The presentation in the executive summary. Ms. Um, Cole. When it was published. When it was published. Thank you. When it was, when it was published. Approximate day, time. Okay, thank you. Um, so it was published, just for the record, last Tuesday. Thank you. Great, thank, thank you. you. And so that's available to the public then. Sometimes we do things executive content and then, but, it's, but these are available to our public. Um, my question was around uh, initiatives I talked about before and one of the upcoming um, reports on achievement is supposed to be related to grading because the grading policy was a 
approved in 2015 and it was implemented in 2016 um, w before Dr. Williams uh, with a great deal of uh, controversy and struggle. And we were supposed to receive some information about that. Um, and the issue is, are the grading procedures faithful to the policy and are they supportive of the students? And how is the attendance policy implementation? Thank you. Since that time frame affected our students. So thank, thank you, you. Ms. Causey. Um, as reported um, at our previous board meeting, I was trying to retrieve that. You know that we will be providing an annual report on the grading reporting procedures. And that is a part of the academic achievement timeline. So that is forthcoming. Any additional questions? Okay, we're going to move on to the next agenda item. Correct. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. The next item is the update on transportation, and for that, I call on Dr. Jess Graham. I'm going to ask Dr. Yarborough to join Dr. Grimm. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Williams, Vice Chair McMillian, and members of the board. The purpose of tonight's presentation is to educate, inform, and provide a brief update on the current state of BCPS transportation. This presentation will cover the following five aspects of our work. Our mission and vision, what we do and who we are, school bus inspection update, service challenges, vacancies, call outs, and leaves, and ongoing goals. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The mission of the Office of Transportation is to provide safe and efficient school transportation services in an environment that fosters positive social interaction and allows students to be successful learners. In our current operational paradigm, our service is not as effective and efficient as we would like it to be. And we aim to improve that service for our students. However, our operations are safe, and we strive to provide service in a positive environment for our students. After all, our school buses are the first classroom of the day for many BCPS students. Our core mission is emphasized in a vision of continuous improvement in transportation. Next slide, please. What we do, we provide safe school bus service twice a day for over 77,000 students. The picture on this slide is of M&T Bank Stadium, home to the Baltimore Ravens. The capacity of this stadium is just over 71,000. To visualize BCPS's service, think about this stadium. We would overfill Ravens Stadium by more than 6,000 students and empty it twice a day to account for our school bus service. We travel over 80,000 miles per day, over 14 million miles for the regular school year alone. We operate approximately 785 bus routes, and of those 785, approximately 645 are operated by BCPS bus drivers, and approximately 140 are contracted. We service over 200 schools each day, including facilities in Howard County, Harford County, Frederick County, and Baltimore City. We've also had students in the recent past that we've transported to Prince George's and Montgomery's counties on a daily basis. We operate and maintain over 800 BCPS buses at 11 facilities. These buses range in capacity from 77 passenger to buses that can only safely transport a handful of students with disabilities. We maintain and support over 440 White Fleet vehicles system-wide, and we partner with five school bus contractors who supplement our BCPS school bus service. Next slide, please. The map on this slide shows the placement of BCPS's 11 bus lot locations throughout Baltimore County. We work at these facilities and have an office at Pulaski Park. BCPS's school bus contractors operate their own facilities. We proudly employ over 1,000 AFSME, ESP, BC, and OPE staff. BCPS currently employs approximately 545 full-time bus drivers and approximately 265 bus attendants. 
At present, BCPS has a small number of substitute bus drivers in attendance. Over 48% of BCPS bus drivers have 10 years or more experience with us. In our current operational paradigm, our routing assistants, dispatchers, field representatives, and at some lots, fleet staff, customer service clerks, and senior operations supervisors are driving buses or serving as bus attendants on a daily basis, in addition to their primary roles. Our staff are our greatest assets. We partner with another 150 plus contracted personnel. Most of these are school bus contractors, but we also have students with disabilities who utilize other allowable transportation services under COMAR. These are also contracted. We include business management, fleet, and operations as areas in which we work together to provide service. And we represent approximately 4% of BCPS's total budget, and this has been consistent since fiscal year 17. It is important to highlight that we are a non-traditional school bus service. We don't simply take students to and from their neighborhood schools. Instead, we transport students throughout the county and across catchment boundaries multiple times a day to service middays, ESOL, magnet, displaced, homeless, students with disabilities, college programs, and more. Next slide, please. School bus inspection update. The safety of BCPS school buses has been the subject of one media outlet's recent attention. The Office of Transportation thanks the board for this opportunity to set the record straight and provide an update regarding school bus, ins school bus inspections and MDOT MVA's recent random inspection of our fleet. First, it is important to understand that our school buses are constantly inspected. School bus drivers complete pre-trip and post-trip inspections of their school buses every day. These daily inspections often identify issues from trip to trip. When a school bus driver identifies an issue from their pre-trip or post-trip, or they identified an issue while driving the bus, they communicate the issue with our fleet staff who determine if the bus needs to be pulled from service and when the repair will be completed. Again, this happens on a daily basis. In addition to pre-trip and post-trip inspections and the repair tickets that our bus drivers and lot staff submit to our fleet staff, all school buses in the state of Maryland are subject to four inspections each year, one type A and three type B. The difference between an A and a B is that an A is considered a major and includes removing the tires from the vehicle as part of the inspection. Although MDOT MVA notes inspection results as pass-fail, reporting pass-fail for MDOT MVA school bus inspections is not standard. There are three categories used most frequently for these inspections. Pass, 30-day repair, and major defect. While a 30-day repair and major defect are technically considered a fail, how MDOT MVA handles a 30-day repair versus a major defect is very different. For example, a torn seat, a clearance light, the contents of a first aid kit, or an LED light out could technically fail a bus for inspection and result in a noted defect. But it would still be operable within a 30-day repair category. That means the bus continues to operate and MDOT MVA's ex expectation is that the bus will be repaired within 30 days. We know that there was misinformation reported about fuel tank strap inspection failures on BCPS buses. As shared in November, as soon as we received questions about fuel tank straps and out of an abundance of caution, the Office of Transportation immediately removed the identified buses from service. We consulted with the manufacturer and the Maryland State Police, as well as MDOT MVA, in addition to reviewing COMAR, inspection reports and procedures. To err on the side of safety, the BCPS Office of Transportation repaired, reinforced, or replaced the fuel tank straps on 52 school buses. However, none of these fuel tank straps were cited in MDOT MVA's random inspection, and those that were repaired would arguably have not failed inspection because they were still secure by the definition of COMAR. During MDOT MVA's recent random inspection of BCPS's school bus fleet, 39 of 801, or 4.8%, of school buses were noted as having a major defect. These buses were pulled from service and repaired, with most repairs completed the same day they were cited. 
The BCPS Office of Transportation is confident that these numbers are some of the lowest out of service school bus figures in the state of Maryland and support our high standards of safety. For context and comparison, in 2022, the FMCSA, or Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, while conducting uh, commercial vehicle inspections nationwide, cites an out-of-service rate of 21.6%. While this is not comparing apples to apples, the commercial motor vehicles share a lot of similarities with the school bus chassis and engine. But school buses actually have a much more stringent out-of-service criteria due to the nature of the vehicle and the service it provides. Thus, by this comparison, BCPS's out-of-service percentage is outstanding. BCPS school buses are safe. As I said back in November, I am very proud of our fleet staff, and our fleet staff are very proud of their work and would never knowingly enter an unsafe school bus in service. They drive our buses. Their spouses and parents drive or serve as attendants on our buses, and their children ride our buses. Nonetheless, in alignment with our vision of continuous improvement and focus on safety, we have provided additional training to staff and updated forms related to our Type B inspections in this new cycle, which began last week. The purpose of this slide is to provide insight to our greater community regarding the cause of service challenges and the resulting delays. During the month of February 2022, the Office of Transportation compiled the following data regarding bus driver vacancies, leaves, and callouts. A callout occurs when a staff member cannot report to work, whether because of a family emergency, illness, or another personal issue. Callouts are sometimes known prior to the day of the callout, but can happen hours, minutes, and even during our service. In February, we averaged 97 bus driver vacancies. We averaged 63 callouts each day, which represent 8% of BCPS's total routes, or 12% of BCPS's full-time drivers. The highest number of callouts was 84. The unpredictable nature and variance in these callouts make it difficult for staff to plan and implement effective coverage. We average 45 bus drivers out on leave each day, which represents 6% of BCPS's total routes, or 8% of BCPS's full-time drivers. Thus, on average, 205 of BCPS's 785 total routes needed to be covered each school day in February, which represents 26% of our routes. When you combine a national shortage of drivers with leaves and other reasons during an active pandemic and people calling out, there's a direct impact on the timeliness of service. In neighboring districts, they have canceled or eliminated routes and or school bus service as a result of these circumstances, and some have even asked families to transport their own students. While late service is not our goal, we respect and understand that many students need our services and our team works tire tirelessly day in and day out to transport over 77,000 students safely across our school system and beyond. Every day, our team is focused on the mission of serving students. We adjust and problem solve in real time to support our bus drivers as they double and triple back and combine trips and routes to transport our students to and from school. Next slide, please. The Office of Transportation has several ongoing goals with the focus on continuous improvement. We have been working with a consultant to continue to critically consider community feedback regarding our practices and procedures regarding measures we can take to increase our efficiency. Specifically, we are partnering with the Division of Human Resources in support of their efforts to recruit qualified transportation staff and streamline our onboarding process. We continue to improve processes and procedures in compliance with COMAR, included anticipated changes to school vehicle options that will give us additional flexibility in the near future to transport students to and from school. We are working to implement bus radios as a means of communication in collaboration with the Department of Technology. We continue to work with our partners in the Department of Facilities Management to assess and improve facilities for our staff. Next slide, please. We continue to partner with AFSME in retaining school bus drivers and bus attendants by advocating for our staff and assisting in the resolution of employee issues. As previously stated, our employees are our most valuable assets. 
We are working to improve routing practices and procedures by consistently implementing best practices, analyzing available data, and making decisions that result in safer, more efficient, and more effective service. We are working to improve communication with schools and other stakeholders regarding service, as well as being responsive to the issues as they arrive. We implemented a procedure in October of this school year that we are continually refining in order to provide accurate information to schools about daily AM and PM bus changes and delays. Next slide, please. Again, the Office of Transportation is committed to continuous improvement. We are committed to meeting the needs of our students and finding creative ways to address bus driver shortages and related service issues while improving our communication and efficiency. We would also like to take this opportunity to thank the board and the county executive for your support of our transportation staff. Your efforts to remove onboarding roadblocks and to compensate potential and current employees through temporary wage increases this year and bonuses is appreciated. The following quote from proud BCPS bus driver Jackie W says it all. Quote, I've had my run for many, many years and it's a good run. I have kids of kids of kids. I enjoy talking to my students and their parents because I drove their parents. I go to their graduation parties and love seeing them grow up. With everything going on now, I also really appreciate the additional hourly pay. That's really important and really big, end quote. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Ms. Joes. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Thank you, uh, firstly, Dr. Grimms. Thank you for this presentation uh, and coming here and presenting to the board. Uh, the board recognizes that um, there are challenges that the transportation department faces. And I know nationwide we have a shortage of bus drivers. So we have to do everything that we could as a board at a governance level to help you. Uh, when you're talking about improving routing practices, are you currently using a software or algorithm? And how, how do you intend to improve it uh, coinciding with school bell times? So yes, we currently do use routing software to route our, to route our students. Um, we use the software to look at our different school boundaries where we need to transport students to and from. Um, what the software helps us do is we can create um, bus capacities and it basically assigns the students to a bus based on those rated capacities at different levels. Um, we also have to take into account students with disabilities and other different trips that we do. Um, so we, we manually put into the software some of our more complicated trips, some of our shuttle stops, for example, um, and some of our students with disabilities. Uh, in terms of our uh, school starting bell times, um, we use that in conjunction with the software to look at how many students in a particular area we have to move at, a, at a, any given time. Uh, currently, we have four tiers. We have an A, a B, a C, and a D tier um, with our school bell times. The A and the B tiers are our high schools and our middle schools. The C and our D tiers are our elementary schools. So we have early elementaries and we have late elementaries. We do have some other um, special schools or, or kind of outlier schools, I'll call them, that cross some of those times that may start a little bit earlier or a little bit later than the, the group of students that would typically fall under that high, middle, or, or elementary time. So that's a continual process that we look at. Um, we are somewhat constrained with our bell times when looking at the totality of, of what we do. Um, in terms of uh, ensuring safe service, uh, both in the morning and in the afternoon. afternoon. Um, we have some students this year who unfortunately, um, because of delays in our service, are, are getting home around six o'clock um, on a relatively consistent basis. And so those are things that we look at because that plays into the safety of our students. Thank you, and also thank you for clarifying some of the misinformation that's been out in the media. We have 175 schools. You said we transport children to 200 school, over schools. Over 200, over yes, ma'am. Over 200, so those are our those are special no, needs. Yes, ma'am, those are non-public schools. They are also facilities that are, that are out of county as well. So we are not just limited to our 175 schools. 
So that needs to be emphasized because we always just hear the bad stuff. So thank you for everything you do, and hopefully this board supports our Department of Transportation wholeheartedly thank because you. you carry our children to school. So thank you. Ms. Mack. Yes, thank you, um, Mr. McMillian, and thank you, Dr. Grimm, for the information and for the work you and your team do. In the November meeting, I asked, um, I, I believe I asked you, do we expect there to be any material findings at the conclusion of the MBA MDOT inspection? And you responded that you did not expect any material findings other than what normal inspections would find. What contributed to the difference in what we expected the state to find and what they actually found? And what changes, if any, have we made to our inspection and trouble reporting processes as a result of the findings? So to, to, to clarify, I, I believe your first point, Ms. Mack, and thank you for that. Th this is what we expected to find. These are typical um, these are typical B inspection results for us. A, a 4.8% um, on, our, on our majors is a very, very small number. Um, and if data were to be pulled from around the state, I, I think that you would find that that is a, an extremely low number for our majors. And given the fact that um, most of our, our majors out of those 39, um, almost all of them were back in service within a day, uh, with the exception of, of parts that we were waiting for, um, shows the commitment of our, of our staff. So I, I think the, the results were actually consistent and on point with, with what we did expect um, from MDOT NVA. So I'm sorry if that wasn't clear in my comments. Okay, thank you very much mm -hmm. for that. Um, and also, I've had teachers tell me, and I, I understand that you are doing the best that you can, but sometimes when we have students whose parents work mm -hmm. and the student um, and the buses are late and the parent says, don't go outside, keep running to the window and see if the bus is there, a lot of times, um, when the kids are particularly young and the parents aren't there, those kids end up not coming to school. Um, what what can we do about that? Um, I mean, you've talked about your next steps and your goals, but when we have kids who just don't come to school because the, they've checked five times and the bus is late, um, you know, any ideas around that? Um, yes, ma'am, and actually I'd like to go back to, I, di I didn't answer the second part of your first question, which was okay. what, so what, what are some of the changes that we've made, and I just wanted to comment on that. Uh, we, we have changed, uh, we, we have provided some additional training to our staff on COMAR and parts of the inspection process. We've changed some of our documentation practices related to that. We've actually invited M.MVA in to do some additional training with us. Um, and actually last week, we, our county um, hosts the statewide meeting of uh, the fleet supervisors. Um, and we do that on a, on a monthly or, or quarterly basis. It's, it's typically monthly, but it's ramping back up um, from COVID. So we have put a number of measures in place to, to continually improve. Uh, as for your second question, uh, I completely understand where that's coming from in, in terms of the timeliness of our service. And um, I think where we can continue to improve is the accuracy of our communication with our schools around uh, latenesses and, and changes in delays. Our staff, uh, with the means that we have, is, is working very hard at this time to try and do that because we do know that that is a challenge um, for a number of our families. Again, thank you for the work you do. Thank you for the updates and thank you for answering my questions. Dr. Hager. Yes, thank you. Um, and actually, my question is related to what you were just saying at the end. Um, and I thank you as well for the presentation and everything that you do. Um, my, my three kids all ride buses like uh, like others do on the, on the board. Um, and so, you know, through personal experience, but also through talking to a number of people, um, you know, buses are late, as you know, and, and sometimes uh, routes get merged, um, which causes uh, the bus to come home later and things things like that have happened this year. And I think most people's first reaction is to give everybody grace and understand that you know that, that a lot's going on. But when it kind of it, it goes on and on and weeks go by and, and, and it is consistent, who is it that a parent should reach out to? Is it the child's principal? 
Is it someone within the transportation department? What, what's the right route to go just to ask, you know, is this going to be over soon? What, what, what is the solution? This has happened consistently, kind of, kind of one of those conversations. So I, I think that that is a, a great question, um, Dr. Hagar, from on many levels. Um, we always refer questions to to our main line number, which is 443-809-4321. It's staffed from 6.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Um, on a daily basis on, on every school day. And so we can field questions there and, and direct them to the right individual. Um, we also encourage, encourage folks to uh, email us. We have a contact us email address. It's listed on our website. And we can uh, provide uh, those answers individually to those constituents as best we can. I think some of the challenges, um, as I've shared with you in our February data, are really about some of the unknowns and some of the strategies that we need to do to compensate from day to day with the three buckets that we have between our vacancies, our call outs, and our leaves. So um, for example, we might have a very consistent bus driver that um, is healthy and is able to come to work every day and is consistently riding and then something happens to another driver and we need to, as you said, combine the bus driver A's route with bus driver B's route and, and that causes a disruption not only in the uh, route that's being covered but in the, in the consistent route as well. And um, right now, that is just part of the operational paradigm in which we have. We have been working as best we can to tell schools when we do know a problem will continue for a period of time, or if we anticipate there will be a period of time that a certain bus will be consistently delayed. Um, also, if we believe there's going to be something that we believe is going to be delayed for a long period of time, we do try to make changes to see if we can uh, pull it apart. Um, cover it in a different way, combine it with something else. Um, so for those long-term absences in which we are aware, uh, those are some of the plans that we do try to make on a daily basis. Thank you. And I know I, I do appreciate those emails um, in the morning letting me know the bus will be late so that the kids don't stand out in the cold. So all of those, those changes have been really helpful. So thank you. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Um, so one slide, well, I don't know the slide, but one of the slides said that we are trying to implement uh, bus radios. Where are we at right now with this in collaboration with the Department of IT and implementing bus radios? So uh, the Department of Technology is uh, responsible for the, the working with the vendors to program our radios. It's, it's extremely technical and, and beyond the scope of work that we do in transportation. We're really the customer in that regard. Um, and they've been working diligently with, with the vendor to make sure over COVID the, the FCC licensing, the towers, those communications are set up. Currently, the radios have been installed. They are being programmed, it's my understanding. Um, I believe that um, we will be testing the radios um, come the fall is the current timeline that they have provided to us um, between you know, finishing the installation pieces, the, the programming, and the other nuances, I believe they're looking to test them in the fall. Okay, and what is the purpose of the radios? Like, what, what service will that provide to our bus drivers? So it would, it, it's actually part of a larger scale safety initiative. Um, what it will enable us to do is to centrally communicate with all of our school buses, which we are presently unable to do. So it would allow us to send um, mass messages or to announce mass messages to a large group of drivers or to one area of drivers, for example, um, safely, because right now our driving staff, uh, if they have a personal cell phone, they cannot use it absolutely positively while they're on the road. Um, that's not only an infraction in our office, but it's, a, it's an infraction of their licensing. So, um, so communication can be a challenge with them. A radio would be a safe and efficient way to do that. It would also allow us to, uh, to communicate more efficiently across the system. Right now, our leadership staff have radios uh, that, that we use. Our, um, our routing assistant buses, our 25 routing assistant buses are equipped with a uh, 
confined radio system that they're able to use, and then our other leadership staff, we're able to communicate from our central base in Pulaski Park with each of the areas, and then with those limited number of folks in leadership. This will expand that communication out to our bus drivers um, and other staff. That's incredible. Uh, thank you so much. When I visited the Hopkins Creek lock with you, um, I, I noticed that there wasn't running water um, at the lot. How many of our lots currently don't have the infrastructure for wa running water and that kind of stuff? So Hopkins Creek, and, and I want to make sure it, that I'm clear, our, uh, our Department of Facilities has done a tremendous job at Hopkins Creek. There, there is no sewer line at Hopkins Creek. That was uh, built as a temporary bus lot about 40 years ago. Um, so what the Department of Facilities has done to compensate for that, they have put in um, trailers that provide uh, restroom facilities and our, and our office facilities. So they technically do not have running water. There is a, uh, there is a, uh, a current project there in development that is hooking sewer up through that area. Um, it is a, a protected area in terms of the county. Um, so we'll see what that leads to. At two of our other facilities, the Inwood facility and the Windsor Mill facility, our fleet staff do not have access to, um, to water where they are located. Um, I've recently had meetings again with our Department of Facilities to assess those to determine how we might be able to address that situation. Thank you, and I asked that just to kind of learn about what kind of conditions our, our, our bus drivers are in on these lots and what kind of you know, access, resources they have access to. Um, how, what are the roles of our staff members, like at, at a specific bus lot, you know, who all is involved at the bus lot? And I, I learned a little bit about this when I visited with you, but I guess for the whole board, what are, who are the staff members that are at a bus lot supporting our bus drivers? So at each of our lots, we have, uh, we have fleet staff and we have three uh, full shops, which are Arbutus and um, our Arbutus shop our North Point facility and our Cockies facility. And those are, those are what are called large fleet shops. They, they, handle, uh, they handle trucks, they handle school buses, they, handle, um, they can handle major repairs at, at each of those three facilities. At the remainder of our facilities, we have fleet staff that can, that can handle um, minor day-to-day -day type issues, um, you know, batteries that need to be recharged, torn seats, glass, um, other issues, uh, oil changes, some of those types of, of things. So we have fleet staff at each one of our lots. We have uh, a cust customer service um, person at each one of our bus lots. We have uh, two to three routing assistants at each one of our bus lots. We have uh, a dispatcher for each area. We have a field representative at each bus lot, and we have a senior operations supervisor per area, and then of course our bus drivers and, and bus attendants at each of the lots. Okay, thank you. And um, looking at slide five, uh, we see a geographic outline as to where our bus lots are at in comparison to the county. Mm -hmm. And when we're looking at like the northeast zone, and when I'm looking at like, parts of the northwest zone, I feel like there, there's a lot of, there's a large gap in, in terms of where the bus lots are and how they're transporting um, students. So I'm wondering how do we determine which lot is specific to a certain community, to, to which schools? How, wh what do we look at for those boundary lines? So I think that's an excellent question in terms of um, the facilities we have and where they're placed. And uh, one of the things that I've learned in taking this job is that uh, nobody in the community wants a bus lot next to where they live. Um, right, so the, the bus lots that we have, the facilities that we have are facilities that are either owned by BCPS or they are county owned properties. And so all of them have been in existence for a, a, a good number of years. Um, we determine which schools are serviced by the lot based on that geography as best we can to the point that you just made. Um, some of our, our challenges in the Northeast and, and when you look at the growth and expansion of schools and service in that area where the lots are located relative to that area does, does pose challenges to us, does pose service challenges to us. 
However, part of what we do, um, for example, when, when you look at a, a magnet program like Carver that's, that's here in the central area, but students from Dundalk can attend Carver, we split service between our central area and our southeast area in that example. Um, so that we can use those buses, utilize those buses most efficiently where they're coming and going. So Carver's a, a, a really good example where we will we'll send a bus from the central area in the morning to get those students and bring them into Carver. Why? Because once they're back in the central area, we can use them for, for, to, to service other buses in that area, and we do the reverse in the, in the afternoon. So that's just one example. Thank you. And uh, one of the concerns we've been hearing from our community members when they uh, testify for a stakeholder comment and from um, in general is the student behavior on buses. So I'm wondering what are the ways that we monitor student behavior on our buses and how can the board help to enhance monitoring um, student behavior on buses? So presently within the Office of Transportation, our protocol uh, is that our bus drivers um, can address the behavior that, that they are trained and feel comfortable addressing. Um, their procedure is to notify the school via a referral process of, of the behaviors that occur there. Um, schools can also request uh, meetings with our, our drivers or attendants or other staff or bus videos from us. Um, oftentimes there's an exchange of information. We'll hear from a, a parent or a stakeholder or we'll hear from a bus driver about a particular issue um, and then we'll follow up. We will pull the bus video. All of our buses are equipped with, with internal cameras um, that we're able to, to take a look at what the video is on, you know, and provide that to the schools so that they can address the student behavior. Um, our staff does not uh, directly address student behavior. Um, we partner with our, our school staff in order to do that. Um, and in support of our bus drivers and attendants, we often work with the school administration on different issues that they, that they see, whether it's a, a, a solitary incident or something that's ongoing so that we can get the best resolution for the student. Sometimes, just like in the schoolhouse, it's a matter of placement. A student might need more supports um, that, a, that a more specialized bus or a different bus can provide for them. Thank you, and what can the board do to kind of, I guess, assist with, uh, I, don't, I don't know, because I know from experience of talking to bus drivers and, and in my visits that um, when it comes to the cameras in, on the buses, you know, they are only internal, and so you have to physically take the hard drive from the bus in order to look at that. So is there anything that the board can do, any, any future contracts that we might be able to approve that would help make this better? Thank you, Mr. Thomas. At this time, we don't have any, any contracts that are pending for something like that. Okay, Mr. Offerman. Yes, first of all, Dr. Grimm, thank you for not only this fine presentation, but also for all the work that you and all your staff are doing. Uh, my question it, uh, concerns the, 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 uh, the uh, contract people who, who serve our kids who are uh, who are not part of our uh, our uh, our system uh, is there uh, to your knowledge is, is there is there any difference between the training that 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 uh, that the uh, their uh, drivers get co compared to what uh, co compared to what our drivers are get and secondly is there any concern or problem when they're late or they're not able to go or, or show up in terms of getting that, getting that, uh, getting that notice to you. So thank you for those questions, Mr. Offerman. Um, so to answer your first question, we actually train all of their bus drivers. They attend our training classes. And so we train and certify them as school bus drivers. Um, we cannot currently, we, we are not allowed by the MVA to currently test contractors like we can internal bus drivers. Um, so the contracted bus drivers have to actually go to the, the MVA to get to get their license and to, to test. Um, but that is the only difference in their training from, uh, from what we get and what our bus drivers get and what, what our contracted services get. Um, in relation to your second question, 
Um, when a contractor is unable to fulfill their obligations, it is up to our staff to, to fill those in. Um, Last year, our contractors were able to take, um, or actually prior to the, to the pandemic last year, um, is kind of an unusual year, obviously, with, with our return to school. But we had approximately um, 167 uh, contracted routes. And so between that time and um, what we're servicing now, we've actually had to reduce the number of contracted routes uh, by 25 because of what our contractors have been able to commit to, um, which has resulted in those additional vacancies that we've been talking about this school year. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Kuhn. Thank you for your presentation. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at uh, slide six, mm -hmm. and I just had some, and it, it has to do with your the inspections and process and the results. And my, my question to you is kind of a basic one is, is all of the maintenance um, mileage driven? Meaning like at a certain mile, you know, like a car, right? You get a maintenance schedule. So you follow that schedule for all major and all maintenance. Is, is, is it all mileage driven? Uh, all of it's not mileage driven. We, we actually replace our, um, our, our brake pads at a at a uh, at a faster rate than is allowable by Comar because we believe it's safer to do so. Um, so it's it's not just related to mileage, although that is an indicator, just like your your normal process would be. It's also by time. Um, so we take a look at, at you know just these regular intervals when things happen. We do that maintenance. So during the course of these four inspections that we do each year, there are certain procedures that we that we check each time, and we might replace the oil filter, or we might replace other filters, or or the oil itself during that period, regardless of what the mileage is. If we believe that's the safest thing to do. Okay, and and you had. You had mentioned a type A versus a type B. Uh, you do your type A once a year, and you do type B three times a year. Um, and you said at a type A, you're actually taking the the wheels off. The that's tires correct, off, right? Yes. And that's when you have access to the brakes, correct? That's correct. So, are are you only looking at the brakes once a year? We no. There's a visual inspection that's that's part of the school buses. That's part of the the type Bs, um, but the actual actually taking the wheels off is only part of the type A inspection. Of course, we would address that anytime we would need to if, if the driver hears something or, or sees something that's wrong. But through the visual inspection, we can take a look at, at the, um, sorry, I don't remember the technical, ter the technical term on okay. the, on the yeah. brakes yeah. and the bags that are in the, in the back of um, where the axle is to make sure that the system is working properly. Uh, okay, and now I'm gonna switch things up on you a little bit now. Um, this is a large fleet and it uses a lot of fuel. Mm -hmm. And as everybody has watched, for fuel prices have shot up. Um, do we bulk buy fuel or are we gonna be affected by this, uh, you know, budget wise? So we do bulk buy fuel and we do that in, um, w with county government as well. So we share our fuel facilities with uh, Baltimore County government. Okay, so do you anticipate a need for more funds to cover the rest of the school year with the situation that we're in now with, with the price of diesel and gasoline going up significantly? At, at this time, I would say no, we, we do not. Um, but I was speaking to our, our one of our contractors today and with the volatility in the market, um, ask me the question again in a couple weeks and we'll see. At this time, no. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Mrs. Causey. Thank you for the presentation and your passion for uh, transportation and getting our students to school, Dr. Grimm. Um, as a parent and a board member, I appreciate and respect the dedication and the, the care and compassion, the hard work of the transportation staff. I was happy to support each initiative to increase the compensation for transportation, AFSME, and all employees as we acknowledge the challenges and the extra effort that's been required to uh, get through the pandemic and now to return to in-person learning. Um, I also wanted to uh, say that it 
it is, as one public commenter said, it's good to throw out ideas and see what might happen. And so I think with the conversation that we had at the last board meeting, that there has been increased awareness and um, engagement. And one of the things is we heard the, the suggestion, but we've heard it before, which is a two-tier bus driver compensation, with one with benefits and one without with a higher pay. Um, given the timeline and where we are, is that something that's being evaluated and uh, discussed in the collective bargaining that's going on as one possible immediate solution? I, I don't believe that I can speak to that. I, I am part of the negotiations team, but I don't believe that I can speak to that. Ms. Causey, that was addressed by HR in a different setting, and so that's not a part of the negotiation. I'm suggesting that maybe, maybe it should be reconsidered. I think HR responded to that same question when we provided an update to the board. Okay, so maybe if there's a public version that can come out. Um, the other um, issue is um, I provided a email earlier uh, with a document attached uh, which uh, states that as a performance metric for the school system, on-time arrival for buses was included in that. And um, that was in a strategic plan between 2014 and 2018. I was not able to locate the complete document on the website, perhaps because of the ransomware attack. But I request Dr. Williams provide, uh, have staff locate and provide the document to the board uh, because I believe we should include it again as a key performance metric. We know that our children cannot access instruction, nutrition, Thank engagement you, if they're not in the school. Um, I had more to say, but Thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Ms. Rowe. Thank you. Um, how many students are the second part of a double run which causes them to routinely arrive to school after the bell too late to receive breakfast? I'm sorry, can you repeat your question, please? How many students are the second part of a double run which causes them to routinely arrive late to school after the bell too late to receive breakfast? Well, in some schools, the double run is, is planned. It's planned ahead, and so none of the students are late. If it's as a result of a, of a call out that happens on that particular day or is something that we couldn't plan ahead, it could be one bus for a school. It could be several, depending on how many call outs we have that particular day, how many routes we had to combine, and how many we had to double or triple. So do we know how many are routinely late to school? Because of bus service? No, we do not. Okay. Um, how many bus eligible students are driven or walked to and from school by their parents because of unreliable bus service? I would have no way of calculating that, Ms. Rowe. So you don't know like how many students start riding the bus in the beginning of the year but then drop off partway through? Well, our ridership changes during the course of the year based on many, many, many factors. It's based on student participation in, in different after-school events. It's based on the parent's proclivity or work schedule. It may be based on a parent's living arrangement or a student's living arrangement where they get picked up or delivered one or two days a week and not other days of the week. So that ridership often fluctuates throughout and during the year. So I'm not sure that we would have the means or ability to be able to pinpoint it uh, due to a, a lateness issue or anything of that so nature. So we've never surveyed parents to find that out? The Office of Transportation has not. Okay. Um, what's the difference in pay between the contract routes that we have and our own drivers? So we spent uh, approximately, we, we budgeted um, the last pre-COVID year, we spent roughly, uh, we were on track that year to spend $17.5 million on our contracted service. And they supply service to, again, uh, that year it was about 167 of our routes. Um, and our total budget for that year, I believe, was somewhere in the neighborhood of, uh, I believe that year was about $75 million. 
So a driver working for a contractor makes how much per hour compared to our driver? Uh, it depends because their compensation package is different. Many of our contractors provide a high, higher hourly rate and they only pay by the hour for the hours that they drive. So they're not given any other benefits and they're only working what their time and mileage is. Our BCPS bus drivers have a 40 hour guaranteed work week and based on the, uh, the schedules that they have, our middays and so forth, um, they are scheduled for those full 80 hours. So can you break down that data for an update to the board? What, what specifically would you like? I would like to know the contractors that we have that we use, the hourly rate for those drivers versus our drivers. So we can't, um, I don't believe that we can force our contractors to tell us what their hourly rate to their employees is because what they do is they actually bid um, on, a mi on a mileage based on the contract that they have. So our contractors will provide a different hourly rate based on where they are, the mileage, what other benefits they may be providing. Um, there were some figures that were provided in the efficiency audit that had, at that point in time, what the hourly rate was um, that they were compensating. But our contractors are able to adjust that as a private entity at any point in time. So they don't advertise their job listings and available jobs with hourly rates? Some of them do. Um, some of them do not. I guess what I'm asking for is some basis, some basis, what we can find out either through advertisements or otherwise. Um, you cited a phone number, but you also said people who answer the phones get pulled to drive buses at a previous meeting, and I would like to know why can't people be hired by transportation to answer phones and communicate with schools and parents as opposed to having administrative staff, staff driving buses? So our call center uh, in the last two months is now fully, is now fully staffed. So that 443-809-432 number goes right to our main call center, which is at Pulaski Park. Those are not individuals at our bus lots driving buses. However, it's the folks at those lots that we rely on to get some of our information. So sometimes that communication is challenging to get from them. But between 6.30 and 5.30 p.m., we do fully staff that call center. So how come we don't have people just to answer phones at the lot? Because it's been all hands on deck to make sure our kids get to and from school every day. Can't we hire someone just to answer the phone and have the information who doesn't end up driving a bus? I suppose that we could look at that model as well. Those folks, their primary job is to answer the phones. Um, but in the operational paradigm, we've all been out on buses. Um, I, my, myself, I've, I've been out as a bus attendant um, on days that we've been so short we've needed them there. I find it remarkably inefficient that you could have any part of a transportation organization that cannot at any time and every time communicate with every other part when you're transporting children. <laughs> and I just, I don't understand that. Um, Dr. Grimm, thank you for responding to these questions. I want to go back to a, a point that Mr. Thomas said about more radios and looking at ways to improve the communication. And so I appreciate making the decision, all hands on deck, trying to get our students to school and from school. And yes, there's always, as you presented, always ways to improve transportation. So thank you for that. Yeah. I just have a couple of real quick questions. I'm curious, what's the name of the soft routing software? The route, the routing software that you use? Um, route Finder. Route Finder. Yep. How old is it? Uh, the update that we have, we're actually upgrading to their, their plus version, um, which j they just released that last year, within the last year. Um, but we've had, we've had versions of Route Finder for the past eight or 10 years or more. It hasn't been fully implemented that long, um, but they have been in, in business for a number of years. Okay, would the stop sign contract have replaced Route Finder? Uh, 
So it would have uh, it would have more quickly upgraded that. What it would have allowed us to do, however, was look at our plan routes versus what we're actually running and do an overlay of that, which would have improved our efficiency. Okay. And personally, I thought it was a very uh, oh, damn, I had the word. Um, Impressive when the gentleman came down from Canada and addressed us about that contract. I thought that was impressive. I passed Hopkins Creek today. Is Hopkins Creek being crowded out by that new development? So there, there is some construction that's occurring. They're they're putting in a, a new uh, sewer line, we believe, along that area in in Hopkins Creek. Um, and as you can see, they've eliminated a number of the the trees that served as a buffer in that area. Is there any conversation about moving Hopkins Creek? Or are you looking for another piece of property for that? Uh, not at this time. Okay. And one of the one of the uh, slides showed 205, I think, routes, which was 26 percent. Do you remember that slide? Yes, sir. Was that was that routes that were being doubled up? I didn't understand that slide. So what what that shared was on a on a daily basis. Uh, in the month of February, we were covering approximately 26% of our routes every day, which were 205 of our 785 routes. So that means those 205 routes were either being combined, uh, they were be, we were doubling back, tripling back, or finding some other way to cover them because of our combination of vacancies, callouts, and leaves. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, Ms. Scott. Thank you. Um, I wanted to know, I was looking at the slide here. Um, I'm not sure which, it's the second to last, well, the last one, actually, ongoing goals. And it's an improved communication with schools and other stakeholders. And I wanted to know, um, right now, how do you communicate with the schools and um, stakeholders, like when a bus is running late? How is, is that usually communicated? So in October, and, and thank you for that question, in October, we... Um, we looked at that as as a major issue, and we came up with a process where uh, we put some some timelines on our operations staff and said um, at at X time, and it rained, it varies a little bit between our levels, our, our high, our middle, and our elementary. But we said um, we expect that schools are communicated with any known changes or delays um, for that particular morning. And, and one of the challenges, Ms. Scott, is that um, if a driver calls out late because of an emergency or, or something happens, our high school service may well already be underway. So um, our high schools are, are typically receiving that information anywhere from quarter to seven to 7.15, which some routes are well underway for our high schools by that time. But we get much better for our middle schools and our elementary schools because by that point we, we have that data. So what happens is our, um, our bus lots translate the individual information that they have at our 11 lots. Um, we have created school distribution lists. Um, and what they do is they enter into, in a spreadsheet, the information about those changes and delays, and they email that to identified school personnel who then take that information and they share that with their school community the best way that they see fit. Some are using social media, others are using the school messenger system, others are using email that they've created. So each school is, is tailoring that direct communication to their constituents um, based on how we provide it to them. And since October, we've worked hard to improve the accuracy of that information. Because what often happens is the minute we send it out, mm -hmm. something else happens. Um, we, we have a, a, a call out, a, a, a bus is in an accident, um, or something else occurs. There's a, there's a major traffic delay or impediment, and we need to make other or additional adjustments. So we try to communicate them as timely as we can with the schools. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Everybody's had the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grimm and Dr. Yarbrough. The next item on the agenda is the information, which includes the revised superintendent's rule 4202, personnel colon retirement. We're going to move to S on the agenda, S1, 
is the next item on the agenda is board member comments and consideration of agenda items for future board meetings. Board members, please note that these that items provided at past meetings have been received and are being reviewed. Ms. Rowe. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Say that again. This we're in item S1. The next this particular item on the agenda is board member comments and consideration of agenda items for future board meetings. Board members, please note that items provided at past meetings have been received and are being reviewed. And I'm going around the dais, and I just happen to start with you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I wasn't paying attention at the moment. Um, I have no comments. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Causey? Sorry. <clears throat> A lot of screens open here. Um, are we, quick question, we're doing the legislative uh, update next. That's S2. I'm, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that... Uh, I've heard a lot of uh, positive remarks about the mask optional and also um, about the announcements for in-person graduation, end-of-year celebrations, activities, uh, the, um, the uh, performances that we're going to be able to have with band and dance and, and robotics and everything else. So I think uh, we are improving things for our students and staff and families. So that's wonderful. Um, I also wanted to congratulate all the athletes that are finishing up the winter sports. Again, uh, just a wonderful opportunity um, that they did not have last year that we've been able to um, facilitate. Um, and uh, as Dr. Williams said, personally, I'm going to congratulate wrestling because that's what uh, my family's been engaged in in the public school for 25 years at least. Um, and it's just uh, one thing on International Women's Day I'd like to say is that this year is the first year that they have had a dedicated uh, young women, the girls uh, brackets for the uh, women to compete. Um, and it, it's just a thrill to watch. So um, that was wonderful. I, I appreciate the, uh, I also wanted to point out the town hall on student behavior and discipline that's happening on Thursday. There's information on the BCPS website about that. Um, and I also want to um, it, here um, for agenda items, um, public works recommendations. There's so many that are involved in improving board governance, uh, the agenda setting for the meetings. Uh, I really think that the board needs to uh, discuss those specific ones related to governance and leadership, uh, and uh, it, it will really help the school system. So thank you. Okay, Ms. Causey. Okay, great. Ms. Mack? Yes. Um, now that the mask mandate is lifted and volunteers and parents are allowed back in schools, I look forward to beginning school visits again. That's it. Thank you. Ms. Joes? Great job, Mr. McMillian. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. It's my turn. I just, I'm excited about schools, you know, all the activities coming back, you know, the day, uh, everything, everything that's opening up. I'm excited about that. I'd like to congratulate Ms. Cupperson again. And I want to point out that she, if I'm not mistaken, her first, her first setting, her first assignment was Chesapeake High School teaching science. And she was also uh, uh, the head girls varsity soccer coach for Chesapeake High School. So congratulations on that. Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. McMillian, and great job leading the meeting tonight. Um, I want to—I have a few moments or a few comments, and then uh, suggestions. So, I am excited to continue my school visits across the county. Tomorrow, I'm visiting Newtown High School, Sudbrook Magnet Middle School, and Windsor Mill Middle School. So, I'm excited to head over to the West Side. Um, I am excited for all of the work that's happening in the Equity Committee and in the Curriculum Committee, as well as the Policy Review Committee. I want to congratulate um, our Assistant Principal of the Year, Ms. Culbertson, again, uh, because she, was, she gave such incredible remarks earlier today. And I'm excited about my small town hall tomorrow, which is all about student wellness and how we're really doing in our schools. For an agenda item, and I think I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again, I'd like to see a procurement of another contract similar to that $0 contract for transportation um, that we didn't discuss tonight, but we, we, we've discussed in the past. And I think it's really important, especially with hearing um, from our AFSCME, employee, our AFSCME employees and hearing from the transportation department today with the update that we should, we should bring that contract back up and discuss it again. So thank you all. And I can't wait for the legislative uh, discussion right after this. 
Okay. Mr. Offerman. Yes, uh, I look forward to hearing the grade, the uh, grade and and uh, excuse me, quarter the grade and reporting uh, uh, meet, meeting that we'll have soon. And I would also ask everyone to keep uh, all the citizens in in the uh, in the uh, the excuse me again, all the citizens in the Ukraine in their thoughts. Thank you. Ms. Scott. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Um, I um, look forward to Mr. Thomas visiting West Side. Look forward to you coming to our schools. Thank you for that. Um, also, I would like to congratulate all the athletes who um, worked hard this um, winter and um, congratulate those who um, for, you know, just a job well done. And I would also like to say that I look forward to hearing um some more information as far as the efficiency review from Public Works. I know uh, we, I, I spoke about this last time at the um, board member agenda items for consideration, and I'd like to reiterate that again because I, there were quite a few suggestions, and I think that it would be beneficial for us to look at those, to review them, and to work on them going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hager? I don't have any comments. Okay, Mr. Kuhn. Uh, thank you. Um, two items uh, for upcoming agenda items. One, I would love to hear the overall plan uh, from our new CIO uh, about um, what we're doing IT-wise uh, so we fully understand and grasp all the moving parts there. Um, and two, I would like to um, uh, understand the plan for maintaining and addressing uh, and replacing the tracks around the county at the high school level. I had sent a request for information, but I think that this needs to become uh, something that we talk about so that people fully understand how it works um, and when or if they can ever expect um, a, a replacement. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hen, are you available? Are you online? Okay. We're going to move on. The next item on the agenda is item letter S2, a Legislative and Governmental Relations Committee update. Thank you. Thank you, Causey, Mr. Causey, please. Um, I appreciate Ms. Hen um, appointing me chair of the Legislative and Government Relations Committee. Um, and I want to appreciate Mr. Thomas as the vice chair of that committee since I'm transitioning in. He's uh, been a great help. And so the first, uh, first of all, we had a meeting on March 3rd and we reviewed a number of uh, bills and they're uh, making their way through the legislative session. We did bring forward recommendations um, to the board. And uh, I think I'll let Mr. Um, Thomas address the, the bill that... Uh, he was bringing forward. So the bill 476 was um, recommended by the Legislative and Government Relations Committee to come forward to the board, but without a recommendation. So Mr. Thomas, if you'd like to address that. Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah, so this is the bill that we discussed a little bit last time and we didn't end up um, voting on because we didn't have the amendment information available to us. But since then, the amendment information has been available. This bill would, uh, in it, with its current form now with the amendments, which it passed the Baltimore County House delegation unanimously, um, would require the staggered election for the appointed members of the Board of Education starting with this next term. However, the elected members of the board would begin in November, or sorry, in the first meeting in December is when they would have their, their first meetings elected members. But the appointed members for the 2022 school year only would start sometime when the governor appoints them, sometime prior to February 1st, 2023. So that could mean the governor is, um, is elected, or is the gubernatorial inauguration is mid-January. So between mid-January and February, the appointed members would transition into that role. Now you might, your question might be, well, what about the appointed members we have right now um, who are currently in the role? Well, their term would be extended for two months, and in the event that they did not want to continue participating, they could resign from the Board of Education in order to you know, not continue to participate. Um, 
So those are, that's how this bill would be, uh, that's, those are the amendments and they are, I sent them all out to all the board members so that you have access to them in writing. Um, it addresses the concerns uh, I believe that were raised last time and if there are any questions, I'm here to answer them or we can have some board members answer uh, them as well from the legislative committee. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kuhn has a question. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Dr. Hager, please. Um, yeah, I I just would like to say that I still object to the amendment that um, has the governor elect new members in January this time around. I can see, you know, changing it for the future, but um, but doing it this time, <laughs> I don't know. It, it, I, I find it a little bit offensive in a way that um, there's, uh, it just feels like there's a concern about the choices of the current governor, which would include the four of us that are appointed now. And um, I don't know. It, it, and then also making us stay on two more months after our term is over. It's just a very odd amendment to me. And I really have a, I, I just, I don't, don't think it's a very good amendment to an overall good bill. So that's all. If I may. Mr. Thomas, would you like to comment on Dr. Hager's comment? Thank you. Yes. So in, in, in accordance with state law, and I don't have the law in front of me, but uh, a governor in the state of Maryland is not supposed to be able to appoint anyone in, in their, I don't know what the exact date is, but in the final months leading up to the end of their term. So if we were to have the governor appointing members for this next year um, who cannot run for office for a second, for another term because they've expired the amount of terms that they can exhaust, um, it would it would be breaking kind of the, the law in, in a sense. So that's why it's important that our legislators felt, and it was unanimous in the sense that we need to change this so that in the future, you know, this won't occur again because it would be in the off, uh, it would be in the presidential election instead of the gubernatorial election. So it needs to be addressed because of the law this year and moving forward. And it, it doesn't, uh, to in, in terms of my interpretation, this is nothing personal against the governor um, who is currently in office. And uh, as was discussed in another bill in the legislative committee, you know, the nominating commission is the, it really determines who the finalists are for the appointed members. So, you know, doesn't, in, in my opinion, it wouldn't really matter who's appointing the members because we already have our stakeholders choosing who those finalists for those positions would be. So it's, it, this is something that's required by law, um, as I've spoken with Delegate Ebersole about, and our, and our legislators in Baltimore County voted unanimously to support. Thank and you. So, the, so uh, Mr. Thomas, so the, this in the, in prior, for prior governors who had not run for re-election, they, they did appoint board members, is that correct? I, I can't speak to prior elections because I, I don't know how that was. This is the first time we have a hybrid board that, you know, we have a governor who is, has expired all of their terms and cannot run again to appoint anyone else. It's not, uh, yeah, okay. I, I still, I, I, I don't, I do not agree with that amendment at all. So that's all. Okay, Mr. Kuhn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Millian. Um, I, I disagree with this. Uh, I think besides the comments that uh, Dr. Hager made that I agree with, um, one of the key issues that I have with this is not seating your entire board at the same time creates some management issues for the board and it also creates a significant issue because you're talking about replacing board members that have been involved in the budget process right around the time that they're supposed to go and start voting for an operating budget. I, I believe like the second uh, Tuesday in February is usually when it occurs. So that's a tremendous issue that I just see like a, like a reality setting in type issue. Um, so. You know, I've already made my opposition to this known. I will not be sticking around for extra months. My term is up, and they need to seat people. And like you, you made the right. You know, um, Mr. Thomas made the point that the the, the nominating committee is not going to change, and the people that are going to be nominated and brought forward to the governor is not going to change. So, I, you know, I just see very little value of that. I, I do agree with the actual staggering going forward. Um, uh, but I, I don't think that this is, is going to be valuable, and I'll be voting against it. Uh, Dr. Hager has a comment to Mr. Kuhn's comment, and, and then we'll go to Mrs. Causey, okay? 
No, I mean, the budget comment is is, is a really relevant one. Um, but in addition, the board leadership, I mean, there's so many things that happen when, when you don't seat your board at the same time. Um, I, I just, yeah, I, I think that the, that the comment that Mr. Q made about the budget, though, is is incredibly important to consider. So that, that's all. Thank you. Ms. Causey. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the um, discussion, and I, I know there'll be more. I'm opposed to this legislation. Uh, while the board did vote specifically to um, stagger, um, the board did not vote to change the timing of the seating of the members um, and, and those other things, and I think there are incredible negative impacts of that. There is, in fact, um, a method I understand, and if I, if I could ask the um, board counsel to um, check on this, if that's okay, Mr. McMillian, um, and provide a input to the board, because my understanding is in this situation uh, that happens in other districts as well, the uh, governors would make the appointments uh, before the primary. So my understanding is the nominating commission has already started accepting applications, uh, but I, I think it would be helpful to have that clarified, because people have made the statement that there is no way for board members to be appointed, and I don't think that that's a fair statement. I think that there is a plan right now to use a nominating commission and to appoint four members that would then be seated in December at the same time as those that are elected. Um, but I will be uh, not supporting this bill. And if you can evaluate that request, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thomas is next. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to remind everyone that, you know, this this time when the elected and appointed members wouldn't be in at the same time, it's for, it's for one year. And it's kind of, in, in my eyes, the only way to really transition to this much better system of governance for a Board of Education. It, you know, it's, it's, it's only for one year. I just wanted to make that very clear. And also, um, to a point that was, that was, that was just made, uh, you know, if we aren't supporting this bill, then we're really not supporting, you know, fixing the problem that is that we could currently be breaking, or this is, the governor could be breaking the law by not appointing another board member. So to me, this is very clear, but I understand the concerns of other board members. I, I think that we just need to think long term as to what's going to be best for the Board of Education um, and, our, and, and governing our school system instead of maybe how we personally would feel about sitting on the board for an additional few months. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Um, so, Mr. Thomas, we discussed in the legislative committee about an amendment because this had seated the elected members at the same time as the appointed members in January or February. And you said that they had changed that in amendment, but I've looked through the documents and I've looked through the amendments and I cannot find the language appears to still be the same in that um, it says that it, it, it deletes um, beginning on the first Monday in December after the member's election are appointed and, and then it inserts the section that says a member elected to the county board shall begin their term on the date that members are appointed in accordance with this paragraph, which would still have the entire new board being seated in February right about when we... Um, vote on the budget, and I wondered if you could point to the language where that was amended. So I'm reading the language right now. Um, when I said that, I was referencing what Mr. Bazemore had said in our committee. Uh, on Amendment HB 476, 143924-1, um, it says in line 8, strike 2 and substitute 3. In the same line, strike the and substitute in 2023. The in line 20, strike A2 and substitute A3. In line 26, strike A gubernatorial election year and substitute 2023 after line 39, 29 insert. And then the next amendment strikes elected and... So it, it just it would be appointed. Um, so it, to my knowledge, the two amendments that I, I, I shared with the whole board, I forwarded the email from Mr. Bazemore. This was what was uh, accepted and, and voted unanimously by the Baltimore County House delegation about. Um, it, 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 it does explicitly state for the 2023 year that this is for the appointed members. 
and it's it's a little all over the place in the amendments, but it, that's the, it, the the what our legislators. Okay, all right. Can you slowly read that amendment again so I can read it with the actual document because it was for what? Um, I may. Yeah, it's I, I emailed it over to to everyone. I can see it. It just doesn't make any sense that that's what it actually says. Yeah, the original. So the amendments that were adopted, they weren't. They they aren't actually on the initial bill document, but those amendments were supported by the Baltimore County House delegation unanimously. And so when it goes forward in the House, these amendments will have the favorable report of the testimony. So what I was hoping to do today was to request a favorable report from this from the Board of Education with the bill and the amendments. But seeing as it that does not seem like the consensus, then I, I would prefer if we take no action on this bill since it was brought forward with no recommendations. If we just take no action and continue to, to move along. Since there are concerns, um, and you know, maybe they could be resolved with more conversation. Ms. Rowe. So if I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm, I concur with taking no action. Ms. Causey. Thank you. I just want to point out that uh, comments made about um, this this will fix everything and it'll be better moving forward. The original hybrid elected school board bill did have staggered starts, but um, apparently the legislature at some point decided that they wanted to remove all the appointed members at the same time as the elected members, and so they changed the law. So this is not the first change or proposed change. So um, I think what the board voted on was to have staggered starts should try and be uh, developed fully next session um, in a way that makes sense and does not have um, dysfunction at the beginning of a of, of a full board's um, transitioning in um, with board members not being able, with appointed members not being able to vote for the chair and vice chair. So I'm actually going to make a motion to oppose um, House Bill 476. Second, Mac. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor to oppose the bill. We have a second discussion. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I have a question for legal counsel. So um, you know, I don't have the state law in front of me right now, but if we were to support, to oppose this bill when it's fixing the law that would allow a lame duck governor to, sorry, I said to address this to Mr. McMillian, sorry that would allow Liam, the governor to appoint members even though that's against the law currently. Um, would, could we face legal ramifications on this board for opposing this bill that, is, that, that would be fixing something that, that would occur that would currently break the law? I don't have a clue. Could we, can I ask, can council respond? I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy to respond. No, the, okay. the, the board's vote on uh, this bill uh, doesn't ex expose you to anything. It's, General Assembly's gonna do what the General Assembly's gonna do. Okay, thank you. And I, again, I'd just like to express that I think we should take no action because um, I, I really believe that this is something that uh, if they need additional clarification, we could take action at a later date. But uh, you know, this is something in our, in our legislative priorities. I, I just think we should take no action, thank you. Dr. Hager has a comment. Um, I just was wondering about the um, language of the motion because again, I, I, I like the other parts of it, it's just the amendment that creates this delayed um, appointment. So I, I, my, my question is, if we oppose the bill, um, it, would it be better to oppose the bill as amended or kind of, is there a better language it, unless others feel differently? But again, I, I like the bill overall. I just very much disagree with the um, extension of the appointed term for all the reasons we talked about. I don't know, if we oppose it now, we oppose it totally, right? Yes. Does that make sense? As it currently stands. We oppose it as it currently stands. So if it ends up, if they end up dropping that amendment, do we, is it breaking rules to then, then support it later? No, no, that would be fine. If okay. it comes back, if it comes back to the board in another form, the board can, Vote on it again. Okay, thank you. 
Ms. Jones. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Thomas, I apologize. I've not looked at the bill, so I'm kind of ambiguous about it. But my question, I guess, to Mr. Brissett is, what does it matter what this board votes, yes or no? The General Assembly will make the law. Does it, does it have any impact? I mean... That's more of a political question than a legal question. Okay, so I, I guess I have no say on this, Mr. Uh, Thomas. I mean, what was the intention of bringing this to the board if you had discussed it in the committee? The intention was for discussion amongst the other board members to hear, hear what other board members had to say about this bill. In general, it's a bill that relates to our at local education system in general. So we just brought it forward with no recommendation to hear the feedback of other board members to see if we could, if we should take a position, if we shouldn't, if we should not. Um, I know I, ha I know I don't have the floor right now, but I did have another question, um, but it, it just slipped my mind as I was responding to you, Ms. Joe. So I I don't. Oh, I, yes, I have remember it. But so as the bill stands right now, there were two amendments proposed. The Baltimore County House delegation submitted a favorable report for this, but it still has to go through the House Ways and Means Committee. So, you know, the bill right now is still in the original language at, in its process. The committee hasn't, the official Ways and Means Committee hasn't taken any position on the amendments yet. So I do think if we were to oppose it in the intent that was being raised by a former board member, um, a member at large, then might be better to say oppose with amendments because with the amendments Submit, supported by the Baltimore County House delegation. But, or we could take no action. Ms. Causey. So uh, I made a motion to oppose it because the original language was not, in my opinion, satisfactory and uh, the full board did not want to take action on it with the original language, uh, did not want to give it a favorable report with the original language. And I feel like the amendments do not solve the issues. Um, and so I made my motion to oppose it. And actually, I was looking at the um, sh um, screen, and maybe I should say give it an unfavorable report. Um, also, the issue is the time frame. Uh, we have the nominating commission that's already accepting applications, and there is a timeline where it can be accomplished before the primary. So I feel it's important to have uh, the board's perspective known so that it can be set and it can be accomplished. And then next year, when there's more time in the legislative session, they can uh, address it in a, in a more clear and uh, functional method for the, the next cycle. Thank you. Ms. Mack. Yes, um, I support Ms. Causey's motion simply because this is the third time we have had late night discussions about this one bill. And we continue to have questions and ambig ambiguities. And I think that, to, to Ms. Causey's point, let's get it right the next time and, and not continue to try to push this through when it's so unclear. And the legislators are going to do what they want to do anyway. Okay. Ms. Ms. Causey, exactly what was your the wording of your motion? Was it... I move to oppose, oppose. House okay. Bill 476. Okay. Mr. Kuhn is typing something. No? <laughs> How about Ms. Ha Dr. Hager? Okay. So there's a motion on the floor to oppose Bill, what is it? Mr. House Bill 476. House Bill 477. 76. Excuse 70, me? 76. House Bill 476. Yes, I'll put it in the chat, too. There's a motion on the floor to oppose House Bill 476. Ms. Point of parliamentary procedure. Excuse me? Point of inquiry. Go for it. Thank you. Uh, so we are vote, or just clarification, I don't even know. So if we vote yes, then we want to oppose it. If we vote no, we do not want to oppose it. Correct. That's Correct. My interpretation. Thank right. you. I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Gover, please conduct a roll call vote. Ms. Rao? Abstain. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? No. Mr. Offerman? Ms. Scott? No. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Thank you. Favor is five. So the motion did not pass. Okay. Okay. So, so okay, we're on to D. 
excuse me, tea. <laughs> it's been a long night. The last item on the agenda is announcements. The board will hold a special public hearing on board policies 5550 and 5560 regarding school climate and school discipline on Thursday, March 10, 2022 at 7.30 p.m. The meeting will be held virtually and pre-registration will be required to sign up to speak. More information may be found on the board's on the board's participation by the public website or in board's doc in this agenda item. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, March 22nd, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight. The meeting is now adjourned. Looking forward to Miss Hen returning. <laughs>